we supported West Ham United when we were kids because of how it made us feel. It wasn't about a slogan. And that feeling has gone. And that's where this board have failed abjectly. My love for actually going to the games was dying because I think as a club, we were pulling away from what we were. I think this is the worst point in the club's history, okay. if I'm perfectly honest. I think there's probably quite a lot of people who just actually hate going to the ground. Um, and generally the football's been poor, so there's, there's not really a lot to commend it. So I think there are a lot of people who actually just don't like going into the Olympic Stadium. But I think a lot of people just don't can't stand the owners. I said, well, hang on. In terms of reference, says, our year is up. And she said, oh, yeah, well, we'll just roll it over another year. And I said, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't have a terms of reference and just vote ourselves in another year. The existence of that organisation allowed her to abscond away from her responsibilities to engage with fans. If the OSB no longer exists, she has to engage with someone. And she's got the front to come out and say it's the most successful migration history. It's absurd. We were sold a dream, which has turned into a nightmare. They had the strongest brand of our kind of scale of club mm -hmm. in English football. And they've blown it. I, I think the support base is together now. Um, I really do. I, I think that the 20,000 or so that would have might have been disillusioned with everything uh, are now looking at a way forward. I'm quite positive to tell the truth. Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending upon exactly where and when you are watching this show. The second in a short series of panel shows sponsored by supporters group Hammers United. In these broadcasts, a number of prominent, well-known and or highly respected supporters have been gathered to get, don't laugh, have been gathered together to share their thoughts on current affairs at West Ham United Football Club and charged with sharing their views while attempting to help plot a course for success. Gentlemen, I will leave you all to figure out for yourselves in which of those particular categories you fit into. Earlier this week, Chris from Hammers Chat hosted the first show, which you can find via Hammers Chat's YouTube channel or on Hammers United's website. This time it is incumbent upon me to keep the good and the great from our fan base calm, collected and respectful on a show which is being hosted on KUMB.com's YouTube channel, as you will no doubt be aware by now. Uh, joining me on the show tonight, or this afternoon, today, this morning, whenever you're watching it, I'm delighted to welcome Eamon from KUMB, Jim Kearns from the H-List, Steve Law from Hammers United, George Bernard, who is a Hammers United member, uh, committee member Andy McConnell, and Sean Weston from Claret and Hugh, all of whom have done the miles over the years in support of the mighty West Ham United Football Club. We congregate here at a time of much concern for the club, a time in which many fans have come to the realisation that the move to the London Olympic Stadium may not quite have transpired to be the dream they were sold. With this in mind, many fans have questioned the board's insistence that the transition from Upton Park to Stratford has been an overwhelming success, or even the greatest stadium migration in history, as it was once described by the club's vice chair. That dissatisfaction has, of course, manifested itself in a series of highly visible protests, with the largest back in February attracting more than 8,000 loyal West Ham United supporters in a stroll along the Greenway. Additionally, it is a time when fans have expressed concern over the club's identity, with many asking, are we still West Ham United? And of course, underlying every concern is the GSB Out movement, which permeates pretty much everything involving the club, on the whole, on the World Wide Web and social media, at least, currently. As for the topics of debate, we shall be discussing some or all of the following time permitting. I shall be asking our panel for their thoughts on the current situation. Is it harmony or discord? Is any perceived rift between the board and the fan base irreparable? And we're going to be talking about the London Olympic Stadium. Is it a white elephant or a golden opportunity? Uh, is the club now West Ham United or West Ham London? And if the latter, how can we reclaim its identity? And also we'll be asking, how can the disenchanted and disenfranchised fans, of which there are thousands currently, be won round? But to get us underway tonight, I'd like to gauge where each member of the panel stands with regards to the current situation at the club. So with that in mind, I shall come first to Andy McConnell, one of the committee members at Hammers United. Uh, how are you doing, Andy? 
Yeah, I'm very well, thanks. And uh, thanks for having us on for doing this. Um, I think this is the worst point in the club's history, okay. if I'm perfectly honest. Um, I've been supporting the club for 45, 46 years, actually. Um, and I've never known anything to be so bad. Um, right. I absolutely hate it. Tross came up with a beautiful analogy a few days ago when he talked about being on the centre circle at the old Upton Park under the lights and turning towards the North Bank and seeing 6,000 people walk out. And yeah. this time around, myself and my son, we've done that. We've walked away. And it's it's really disappointing. But I cannot continue going over there with those three in charge. So hopefully that answers your question as to the way I feel about it. Uh, why do you feel like that, Andy? Just briefly, if you can summarise it, you know, in a few sentences. I could be here all night. Um, <laughs> I think we've been absolutely sold a pup. I think we've been conned. For me, the biggest bone of contention um, was selling the bowlin. That that really was the, the end of the road for me, uh, as far as having any confidence in those three to do anything for that club. Um, and I... I I mean, you know, having been a West Ham fan as long as I've been, it's not about the glory, it's not about the success. There hasn't been that much of it, as we yeah. all know. But it's yeah. about the day out, it's about meeting people, it's about going over this, it's, it's the whole thing. And that has been taken away, lock, stock and barrel. Um, and I think that really does underpin. I mean, there's a lot of other things that go along with that, but that really underpins my disappointment with the situation as it is. Okay. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for the intro. I'm going to come to Steve next. Steve, someone else who's quite heavily involved with Hammers United and has been does a lot of work diligently behind the scenes, as I understand it. Steve, how are you doing, buddy? Yeah, hi there, Graham. Yeah, yeah, try to really. Um, yeah. I, I think I, I, I've reached a point where, like, like was just said, where we've reached a bit of a bottom, and I, I didn't think that we'd ever be where we are. I, to be honest, I was going to walk away and. And didn't th I thought we were Arsenal light forever. Um, but I think a lot of credit goes to Bubbles, not only for what he did on the pitch, which I, I think stood out as opposed to what other people might have done and, uh, and amongst all the controversy. I think he, he really did fall on his own sword. And um, I saw him at Swansea away, actually, before he did that, which was when the march was cancelled and when our, our support base, and I'm, I'm largely talking about our away crew, I think. Yeah. Um, we really split asunder. It was a terrible thing, really. It was our, yeah, it was our own worst low point for me that day. And I saw Bubbles uh, in tears um, in the concourse. And the next thing I, I saw him, the next time I saw him, it was when he was on the pitch. So I had the pleasure and the, um, the privilege of representing him um, in court. And uh, he said to me at the time that he was going to try and put a team together. He was trying to try and put about 12 different people together from disparate viewpoints across our supporter base to try and cut through all that political crap that was flying around. Um, so he brought together some, some people who, who really sort of like stepped up. I think, you know, hats off to Dross and Andy Byrne and, and so a lot of the other people on the committee who are diverse and, and were almost sort of like um, cast themselves as almost real West Ham, re, you know, reformed initially at least. You know, that division's took, taken a while to heal. Mm -hmm. but, but I'm far more confident. I, I think the support base is together now. Um, I really do. I, I think that the 20,000 or so that would have, might have been disillusioned with everything uh, are now looking at a way forward. I'm quite positive to tell the truth. We, we, uh, but maybe we'll talk about it later, but there is a chance to, and certainly with Sean, I'd like his input, but um, talk of reforming the ISB for, for want of another word and try and get that sort of like codified into a supporters group to take us forward together into the future, whatever it is. I think that's our first reasonable and only logical step um, so I've tried to do that. I've, I, you know, I wrote a couple of letters and had my input for what that was worth. Um, and I, I think we're moving on. Okay, good stuff. J just coming back to one thing you said there, Steve, you said you, you were very close to, to walking away. Um, why didn't you at the time? Was it purely because of, you know, bubbles driving that, uh, that, that change or, you know, was it, was it something else? I had a car crash actually and I was taken on a wheelchair to the new stadium I wasn't particularly going to go but I saw a different side and I met a few good people I went on the Hornchurch coaches and got to know those chaps and uh, mm -hmm. they looked after me so um, that carried me through a bit I, so I carried on going but I, I rather meant more the, that Swansea away game that when the yeah. march was cancelled I, I, that, that was the time I thought I've had enough of this I don't mm -hmm. want to get it anymore and I thought Bubbles was 
over optimistic in his talking. He was talking about trying to get sort of like up to 10,000 people marching. And I thought, you know, you, you thought there's no chance of that. But it happened. That's the last thing that actually happened at the ground. Uh, it's, it's hard to believe, isn't it? But that's the very last thing that occurred. And that was a, such an uplifting day, I thought. I thought, and, and from then on, I, I thought we can move together. You know, we're together. Screw what GSB, what happens to them. We, we're not in control of that, but we've got a responsibility to ourselves to, to not bicker and to, um, to, to move on. Okay, good stuff. Thank you, uh, Steve. Uh, George, I'll come to you next. Um, I'm presuming you're the youngest men member of our panel tonight, uh, having a look around at some of these uh, wizened and, and sage faces that are joining us. Um, tell us, tell us uh, what led you to becoming involved with Hammers United, buddy, and uh, you know why you feel so passionately about uh, what it is they do. Um, basically, I've had a season ticket for the last four years. Um, for the first two seasons, I was buzzing to go to pretty much every game. Um, at the start of two seasons ago now, I got an away season ticket. And halfway through that season, my love for actually going to the games was dying. Because I think as a club, we were pulling away from what we were. Mm -hmm. At Upton Park, we were West Ham United. And since we've moved from there to the Olympic Stadium, I think it's just become a corporate shell. Okay. Uh, what, what do you blame that on exactly? Why, why do you think that is? Um, there's a couple of things really. Obviously, you've got more corporate fans coming in. Um, you've got more seats to fill, so if you're not going to get as many die-hard fans as you would at Upton Park. Okay. So I think a lot of the spirit of West Ham has been left at the Berlin, and I don't think unless you move to a ground that's purpose-built for football, you're never going to get that back. Okay, good stuff. Thank you, uh, George. Uh, Jim, let's come to you next. Uh, the owner of the H List, one of the most popular uh, and simply brilliant uh, West Ham blogs out there, uh, if I may say so. Um, good to see you, buddy. Uh, what's your What's your thoughts uh, on on the current situation? Where do you stand? Uh, well, thank you. That's a very nice introduction, Graham. Uh, much appreciated. Um, I, I think I I, I, I recognise what people are saying. Um, I, I think that. Um, Perhaps the, the way that I view it, and I was thinking a, bit, a little bit about this today, uh, you know, for the entirety of my life, really, watching West Ham, there has been discord between fans and owners, as far as I can remember. Um, you know, I, I, I defer to, to others um, to talk about what came before the Kearns family, uh, with, with a C, I should point out. But, you know, the, the Kearns family, uh, Terry Brown, subsequently, we had a brief period of, um, of elation when the Icelandics arrived and it turned out they didn't have any money. So then we, you know, we ended up with GSB. I think there's always been uh, a quite uh, a difficult relationship between owners. You know, people will remember the bond scheme being on the pitch, the red, um, uh, the red things, the sort of leaflets that were handed out one night about Michael Tabor and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's, I think there's often been discord. I think what is underpinning this particular um, uh, kind of period at the moment and, and why I very much understand why people are so angry um, is that all of that stuff, was never um, set against the backdrop of, of fans being particularly promised anything. You know, I never, I never got a sense from from Terry Brown that he was promising anything really beyond uh, getting through the next year and probably sort of running the club sort of sensibly. Even though, you know, at the time, I'm not sure anybody really felt felt that. Uh, the difference is that these guys have promised a lot more, and I think that is why um, people feel let down in a way that they never really did with the Kearns family and Terry Brown, because as I say, they were never offering up anything. So I think that to me is what is underpinning all of this. And then I think when you layer on top of that, um, the sale of the Bolin and the fact that, you know, our stadium uh, is is not great. I think it's very unfortunate for, for Sullivan that the Tottenham stadium has been built concurrently and is, you know, just it's like light years away from what, um, from what we're experiencing as fans. So I think there's a, there's a few different things and I recognise what people are saying. Um, you know, where I sit generally is, yeah, I'm supportive of a change of regime, but I think it's probably a bit unlikely. And um, what I actually really, really would like is West Ham to be run competently. And I think that we're a long way from that. And that, and that I think, is what, what sort of alarms me most at the moment. OK, well, I think we'll come back to that point actually a little bit later. And I think it's going to be a key discussion point. Um, but... 
yeah, I mean, it seems that that seems to underlie a, a lot of complaints, doesn't it? The fact that I think you make a very good point there that the Kearns and, and Terry Brown, especially, didn't promise the earth and didn't promise anything, as you, as you, as you rightly say. Um, of course, as we'll all remember, it was our turn to be relegated in 2003, as, as dear old Terence told us once. But uh, yeah, that seems to rankle, doesn't it, most with a lot of people? The fact that, you know, we were told this would be the, the greatest stadium migration, you know, the, all those things about the seats being so close to the, to the ground. And it just hasn't materialised that way, has it? I think that's exactly right. And, and I was actually pondering today um, what Sullivan said when he took over. And I don't know if people remember that, but it, one of his first or the, the very first press conference, he was lamenting how unbalanced the squad was and how there'd been a load of um, outlay on the squad that and it was completely unsustainable. And now we were in a terrible situation. Well, guys, 10 years on, he's saying exactly the same thing. The interview he gave for TalkSport last week, he literally said, you know, the squad was so unbalanced as though it had just sort of materialised out of nowhere. <laughs> it was nothing to do with him. Um, and, and similarly, you know, was lamenting a load of money being spent last year on, on players who, who haven't um, turned out to be worth the money. Um, you know, the, the, the reality of the Sullivan regime or the, the reign to me is that we haven't moved on on the pitch. We are still where we were when he took over. Um, but unfortunately, we're not physically where we were. We're now in the London Stadium. So there's no leeway. Fans won't forgive that yeah. because we were promised something different when we moved. OK, good stuff. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Sean, let's uh, bring you in now. I, I suspect um, you might have a slightly different stance to uh, most of the panel, uh, given your association with uh, Claret and Hugh uh, and, uh, you know, the material you, you publish. Um, What's, uh, what's your current view on, view on the current situation? I mean, you know, as, as some people may be aware, you've, you've slightly altered your stance uh, a little bit in recent weeks and months, perhaps towards perhaps not all of the board, but uh, at least to one particular member. Uh, I, I agree with Jim, um, which will surprise him. Um, we were sold a dream, which has turned into a nightmare. And, and, and I make him right, you know, if we were promised top six, if we move, etc., I don't think the London Stadium is a problem. If we'd won every game since we moved to the London Stadium, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be here tonight and there wouldn't be Hammers United because we'd have won the league, we'd won the Champions League and we'd all be happy and we wouldn't care how far we're away from the pitch and we wouldn't care about the board and we wouldn't care about anything. But we're not. We were promised to move. We've moved into the stadium. The stadium's not perfect. We've not got any extra money. But it, it, in my view, it all comes down to player recruitment. Nothing else. Take the money away. Take the board, everything else. Player recruitment has been poor. Mm -hmm. And that player recruitment ultimately goes back to the board choosing the manager and interference from one particular board member, who we know, who who likes to get involved in transfers. Who is? Let's let's name them. David Sullivan. Okay. Um, you know, he he runs the club like he did at Birmingham, and uh, it's been fifteen years at Birmingham. He got involved there. I know lots of people who knew him there, and of course he brought in Karen Brady, who was at Birmingham as well. She's been in charge ten years, and. You know, my, my view at the moment is it would be very disingenuous if I suddenly became GSB out, you know, and, and joined the march and joined Hammers United. But but I do believe it's time for change. And I don't think you can always change the board when they're shareholders, unless A, they want to sell, B, someone wants to buy, and C, they meet the valuation of the club. And, and to manage expectations, I think, you know, Recent speculation might be just not managing expectations of a takeover. I think we're a long way from that. And therefore, what can you change? In my view, quite simply, Brady's time is up. She needs to be replaced after 10 years. We need a change of direction, change of leadership. But she doesn't pick the players. We need an independent director of football. Okay. And David Sullivan needs to properly step back and be like David Gold and just be a silent partner Pay it, sign in the checks and 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 um let the football club be run properly as as jim said you know restructuring the ground up run competently and 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 then i think then we could see a difference there might be a softening of the way but it all at the end of the day we're a football club and it's all about results if as i said if we'd won every game this season last season we wouldn't be here and we all want to see West Ham winning and, and doing well and moving to that next level we were promised. 
Yeah, I guess it's it's a valid point you make, I think. Of course, if we had one every game, there certainly wouldn't be any protests. But the point is we haven't. And the reason we haven't, I think most people on this panel would agree, is because uh, of the way the, the club is run by those in, in control. So I, I guess whichever way you look at it, it all comes back to the, to the board. Um, what do you make of... You, you You spoke there about promises that haven't been fulfilled. What did you make about David Gold's uh, comment uh, earlier this year? when he said that uh, the, the promises he made weren't actually promises? Well, it's, it's isn't it? It's, it's interesting one definition or another, right? What's the promise? What's ambition, etc. I think some of them, yeah, in, in some people's eyes, they were promises. What I think is, I, I don't think people like David Gold deliberately set out to deceive and lie. Right. That's my own personal view, okay. um, knowing Mr Gold as I do. I think they were over ambitious. Whether they were swept away with it all, um, I don't know. I don't make them liars and crooks, but I do make them failed in their ambition. They failed the club in into taking the next step. So they are failures and they won't like that. But I, I think it's a bit strong, some of the other words. Whether you use the word promise or ambition, it well, he, he used the word difference. promise. There, there's no ambiguity about if, it. Oh, if he, he used, the, used word the word promise, then fine. Yeah, it was a promise. So that promise has failed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. There's Thank no, you. There's sure. no doubt about that. <laughs> okay. Well, well, we'll come back to some more of the, you know, the, the more specific uh, items that we've referred to there a bit later. And we don't want to sort of... Uh, uh, shoot our bolt in the, in the opening statements, as it were. So thank you for that. We'll, we'll come back to those. Um, Eamon, uh, finally, uh, as an introduction, um, I know where you stand on all this, of course. We've spoken about it time and time again. Tell everyone else where, uh, where you are. Yeah, I mean, just picking up on one of Sean, Sean's points there and you know his opinion that it's about player recruitment and if we'd won every single game since we'd moved, then... Hammers United wouldn't exist and nobody would be upset. I couldn't actually disagree more strongly with that if I tried. Okay. Because I think the stadium is a very significant part of the problem. And the way in which we were persuaded, let's put it that way, to move to the stadium relatively quietly is another part of it. And in particular, the, the less than completely honest methodology that was deployed to um, get us to move like lambs to the slaughter, um, all to me smacks of a concerted and concentrated campaign by people who were, at the very least, borderline devious. And at the heart of many of our issues now, I think between the supporters and the club, is the fact there is no trust. Nobody that I know trusts this board of directors that currently are custodians of our club. And they don't trust them because of their behaviour over the last 10 years. And the continual running battles between the vice chair and the supporters, where she seems to be under the impression at some point she'll be able to go in and see the chairman and say, good news, Mr. Chairman, I've won the argument, all the supporters have buggered off. <laughs> okay? And, and, and it's a tone and a, an attitude that comes across as sneering at the club supporters, looking down her nose at all of us, and that she really does know best, when actually... We're the ones that are buying the tickets. We're the ones that are flogging up and down the M6 on a Tuesday or Wednesday night to support the club. Mm -hmm. We're the ones that are taking days off work because, again, our club and others continue to allow things like last-minute fixtures to be arranged at absurdly short notice. And if you think that's a small issue, one of the chaps I happen to stand next to at away games hadn't missed home or away since 1976 until the Man City game last season was uh, arranged at very short notice, for a time he simply couldn't get off work. And therefore a 40-odd year run came to an end. Did anyone at our club care? No. Was anyone on our board fighting hard for our supporters? No. 
And in the same way, when it came to moving grounds, I actually think our supporters were at the bottom of the list in terms of who we're going to look after, whose interests we're, we're bothered about. And the whole things, the statements, world-class stadium, world-class team, these were deliberate sound bites, deliberately planted and repeated to bring the supporters on the journey. And this board of directors have utterly, utterly failed to deliver on those promises. They knew what they were doing. It was, at the very least, borderline deceitful. Yep. And in my opinion, a very sizable part of our support will never forgive them for what they've done. There can be no repairing of the relationship, okay. even if we won the European Cup three years running. Okay. okay. Eamon, I'm, I'm going to stop you there that because... Change. Uh, change needs to happen. Okay. Okay. Uh, a couple of things you mentioned that I want to come back to in a, in a little while. So um, we'll, we'll just hold fire on that for a minute. But thank you for, for that introduction. Let's, ha let's have a show of hands before we crack on. Um, is there anyone here that doesn't think the vice chair should be given her cards? Hands up if anyone believes Karen Brady should be allowed to stay in her current position. I've just put my hands on the floor. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty resounding... Um, vote of no confidence, I think, from everybody here on the panel tonight. So um, that's uh, not particularly surprising, I guess. But ju just summarising quickly before we move on some of your points, that Andy Andy said that we've been sold a pup, we've been conned uh, by the board. Steve uh, referred to the club now as Arsenal Light. Uh, Sean said that uh, the dreams turned into a nightmare. Uh, George said the Olympic Stadium is, is a corporate shell. Eamon, of course, referring to the fans being lambs to the slaughter and the board having utterly failed to have delivered. Uh, Jim mentioning the discord between the fans and the owners and um, one or two other points there coming up. But it's, it's all quite damning of the board. And, you know, we can, we, can, we can see from that exactly why Hammers United exists in, in the first place. Um, you know, I, I, I sort of, I hear what you're saying there, Sean. I just wonder, you know, whether results would have been enough. I mean, you know, do, do you, if we had been winning every week, do you, do you still think, you know, people would be happy with the situation at the stadium? Uh, you know, we, we've seen it all, haven't we, over the, over the years, the, the stewarding issues, uh, you know, the fact we're so far away from the, from, from the, from the pitch, et cetera. Do, do you think, you know, winning football matches genuinely would have, you know, seen all those problems disappear into the ether? Obviously, yeah. you do. And the reason that. I say so. that, I, the reason I say that is we've all been at a London Stadium match yeah. where, you know, it has rocked and we've beaten Tottenham or we've beaten Chelsea in the cup. Yeah. And, and, and we've forgotten about the concrete and the glass and the distance from everything. So okay. it's about the football at the end of the day. Andy, you're nodding your head there in disagreement, I presume. What, what's your view on, on that? Yeah. Um... Okay, first of all, yeah, they're, they're, I'll agree with you to a certain extent. There will be some people for whom winning is what it's all about. And if yeah. we win, they're happy, and that's the end of it. But, and I hear this argument quite frequently, winning is the result of a lot of hard work and effort that goes in at the top of the club. Mm -hmm. I mean, in order to, to win, winning is the result of what the board and the owners of the club have to do, and they just haven't done it. I mean, I'm talking about infrastructure, I'm talking about the personnel scouting, the coaching setup, you know, nurturing young players. And you've seen what's happened with Dean Garner recently. Yeah. That's the, it's just so wrong what they've done. We can't buy the right players. We don't sell the right players. We're not creating an environment on and off the pitch the image of West Ham were a laughing stock. All of that is wrong. There is so much hard work that goes in before the results come out at the other end. And you need professionals who know what they're doing to do it. And my opinion, my belief is we don't have those professionals. What we've got is three chances who haven't got a clue what they're doing. Seriously, that is what I believe. Gold, Sullivan and Brady do not do the things and the work that's required in order to get those results on the pitch. So to simply say that winning 
would solve all of our problems. It might solve some of them, but we ain't going to get to that position with those three in charge. And that's why I firmly believe they've got to go. Okay, good stuff. Thank you, Andy. Um, one of the things I, I wanted to, to bring up, uh, Eamon mentioned there uh, at the end of that uh, particular round of discussion about how he felt the, the rift or a perceived rift between the, the board and the fan base is irreparable. Um, George, I'll come to you first on this one. Do you, do you agree with that or do you think there's some way back, uh, you know, for, for the uh, supporters and uh, for us all to become united again under the current administration? Um, I think maybe under David Gold, because uh, like someone mentioned before, he's taken more of a back seat and um, you don't hear a lot from him as you, you used to hear quite a lot on social media, on radio, stuff like that, where it's more Karen Brady and David Sullivan. Um, but I don't think it's going to ever fully be what it was because I think there's been so many lies, so much deceitfulness um, coming from them. that I don't ever think the fans, and rightly so, I don't think they should ever forgive them. Okay, so no way back for you, George. You, you referred there to lies and, and deceit. You know, what, what specific examples can you, can you think of? Um, I'm sure there's plenty, but... There was a interview done by uh, David Sullivan before we changed the badge saying he would never call us West Ham London yeah now we've got London on our badge so why why would you say something like that and then three or four years later go on and then put London on our badge why would you change it in the first place okay good stuff thank you thank you George um Steve I'll come to you next um, yeah, is, 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 the, is the damage done now? Is, uh, you know, is, is there no way back for this relationship? Can, can Sullivan and Golden, even Brady, I suppose, and not according to the panel tonight, but can perhaps the two co-owners, you know, redeem themselves in some way? No, I think, I think it was posted earlier, I think. We can't move on till they do. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's a universal opinion now. I don't think that's sort of like just a malcontent opinion. And you can look at it another way. They haven't got the clout anyway, even if they do stay on. They haven't got the money. They haven't got the money to, you know, they've bitten off more than they can shift them. We were happy before, as, as Jim was perhaps alluding to, you know, we, we, we weren't promised a lot. We didn't want a lot. We had our own world. Um, they, they've given us another world. And, and they've not got the clout or the nous to take us there and do it, they, you know. So, so even by their own definition, they've got to go. Um, in terms of the relationship, <laughs> and taking it back to the conversation about Hammers United not existing if they'd won every game. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sean knows Nigel, um, and Nigel was part of a group, as was I, that, that saw Brady before the move took place and said, look, you need to talk to the fans more. You, you can't just market this. You've got to find out what the people want. You know, all the old boys in the upper tier of the chicken run, you just got splattered around, you know. I, my dad was a part of that group. There was, a, you know, a couple of thousand of them that migrated there. They weren't consulted and given their own part of the ground. There were so many constructive things that they could have done if they'd just spoken. Yeah. And uh, even if you're Liverpool, you still need a spirit of Shankly. You still need a supporters group, that, that, and you need a board that talks to them. And, and the thing that I can't understand about Sullivan, I, I don't know if it's willful or if Brady is a block completely, but it, it would be a win-win situation for him to, to sort of like sit down and say, well, what do we do about this? What do we do about that? You know, we'd all feel better and, and he'd make more money. And I, I think it's, again, a universal opinion. And I'm hearing this from, from employees at the club that Brady is the block. You know, uh, Sean would have heard that as well. He, he could probably talk more if he could. But that is a universal opinion. Uh, she needs to go and, and Sullivan needs to wise up. But I, I think we're way past that stage, really. I think we were there 10 years ago, the rot set in when they didn't talk. They just, they just talked to us rather than, uh, you know, talked with us. Um, okay. Yeah, gone. Okay, good stuff. I mean, you mentioned there uh, the financial aspect of it that uh, Gold and Sullivan just don't have the resources necessary to, to drive the club forward. What if they were able to, you know, bring in investment from elsewhere? We've we've heard a lot in recent weeks about American potential investment coming in. Uh, that still wouldn't work for you? No, I, mean, I don't. I don't it wouldn't work for the investor, would it? I mean, what are they going to do? Buy gold out and then be a minority shareholder to uh, Sullivan, paying his, his sort of like, you know, estimated worth of the club and having his son sort of like in tow. 
the, the people who can buy us are going to talk about 500 million and then probably another 500 million elsewhere. They're, they're not going to want to entertain any of that. I think that's probably where the, any, any hold up has come in, sort of like buying the place. It's, it's hook, line, or sinker, or nothing, isn't it? You wouldn't tell me another oligarch that sort of like wants to get in bed with David Sullivan. I ain't, I ain't there. Okay, good stuff. Thank you, Steve. Eamon, uh, coming over to you next. Uh, you, you, you started to um, talk about this in your, in your last response, but uh, let's sort of uh, go back to that now. And, and uh, you know, again, I, I know where you stand on this, but not everyone watching the stream does. So, um, you know, irreparable for you, no, no way back at all? Yeah, absolutely no way back. And, and you know, just, just some, you know, the, the, all the talk about big takeovers and things like that and numbers like 500 million flying around. The average supporter... These are huge sums of money that, that most of us wouldn't understand. What we do understand are things like a five-year loyalty scheme where if you've had your season ticket for five years, in the sixth year, whatever it was, you had a 20% discount. Now, that was a promise made by the club to supporters. And the reason why that scheme was launched under uh, the Icelandics and when Duxbury uh, was the CEO was because the club was short of money. They actually came to the supporters and they wanted to be sure that we would actually be putting money into the club as supporters. The club then changed hands. And then what we found is that when the season ticket renewal packs came out uh, under the new owners, uh, Mr Sullivan and Mr Gold, there was no mention of the loyalty scheme. And in the end, we had to have supporters raising it directly with the club and through things like KUMB and so forth and point out, oh, you, you are aware, aren't you, that we're supposed to get 20% off? And of course, it all goes a bit quiet, a bit of denial, that eventually there's a capitulation. And when we address this particular topic uh, with Karen and one or two other uh, club executives three years ago, we were told well, yes, there was no due diligence done, so the club wasn't aware of that. The new owners weren't aware. Correct. And, and, and to me, that really stretches credibility in terms of, A, competence, because were I buying a business, on day one, I would walk in, grab the CFO and say, I want three or four hours of your time, take me through all the accruals that we've got, all the prepayments, Everything that's going to be a nasty on the balance sheet, I want to see everything, chapter and verse. And let's not forget, Mr. Sullivan is financially qualified. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's not a dummy. He would know what questions to ask, as would any professional advisors they employed. So, so for the vice chair to say to us hmm. the best part of a decade later, oh, yeah, we weren't aware of that. There's no due diligence. I'm sorry, but it stretches credibility. And it's things like that. It's not the 500 million pound takeovers that stick in some supporters' minds. It's the fact that the club tried, tried to renege on something that, admittedly under previous owners, had been promised to supporters, but the new owners tried to renege on it. That, to me, was a very early sign that these people could not be trusted. And it's that kind of thing that you say, well, can you really would you really get in bed with these people and and, and not unless you were desperate and a never-ending series of things like that minor things you know the fact that karen continues to do her outrageous newspaper articles that harm the club's reputation we all get embarrassed about prevented us signing a player you know, because she'd been rude about somebody at Leicester City. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why is she allowed to get to do this? She's a paid employee of the club, but clearly she puts her interests ahead of the interests of West Ham United. And to most supporters, well, that's the wrong way around. It should be club first. And again, for my money, that's another sign that, that the, the relationships are broken because her behaviour isn't appropriate. And the people that employ her won't address her behaviour issues. And therefore, you have to call into question whether or not they're fit and proper to run the club. And I, I'm of the view that they're not. And uh, so for me, there's no way back. You know, it, it, it's 
the game was up a long time ago. And again, just to pick up on a point that Sean made about whether or not there's a buyer and all the rest of it. When they acquired Birmingham City, it came about as I think it might have been Karen who saw an advert in the FT, Birmingham City for sale. The administrators had put an advertisement in the Financial Times. So I would call upon Mr. Gold, Mr. Sullivan, if you're not sure of a buyer, stick an advert in the FT, because you know what? Advertising, it works. There you go. Just a <laughs> thought. Thank you, Eamon. Uh, Sean, I'll come to you next, uh, seeing as mm. Eamon uh, re referred to you there. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, we're, we're, there's that general question there about, you know, is, is, is the relationship irreparable? Can, can anything be done to salvage it? Um, why do you think the co-owners allow Karen Brady, carte blanche, to behave the way she does to, to continue publishing her newspaper column, etc.? Why do you think that is? It's a, it's a really good question. And I was told that if, if we survived, um, she was going to give it up this season. And, and that hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's been a friction, I, I won't say, uh, but she earns a lot of money. I'm not going to say how much. And um, well, I think we know how much it's in. It's published in the accounts, isn't it, every year? What? How much she earns from, I'm talking about from the Sun column. Oh, from the, oh, from the column. Um, okay. and, and she, I, I, my understanding is, uh, you know, allegedly she sort of said well <laughs> if you want to pay me that amount of money i'll give it up but otherwise it's 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 what i do uh, and where i get the money and obviously she's she's a lot um a baroness and she and she has to um declare all of her earnings after dinner speech and, and various other magazines and um and, and partnerships as part of her in the house of lords so I, I think she's she's quite stubborn, and you'll know that because you've met her. Um, you know, when the SAB was first formed, which you were on as well, Graham. Um, you know, um, they tried to engage with the fans, but looking back on it, and I was on the SAB continually right up to the OSB last year mm -hmm. when I resigned directly to Karen and said to her, "This is a construct. It it doesn't work. It's got no credibility." And I, I resigned, and they still, still think that's the way to engage with the fans. But did, did you not if, realize that it, it, you know, that was the case when you first joined it, Sean? Well, when I guess, I guess I always believed that that they 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 took on board that they were going to try and improve and change things. But it was like one of those things that never came. Okay, and you know, it's <laughs> yeah. Well, we're we're going to reform. We'll be the OSB. We're going to be completely different. And I've got no belief, by the way, whether the next one that they're planning now, the truly democratic one, will be be any different. But it's easy to say with hindsight. But okay, let well, me yes, go on we'll to that in a little while, I think. The, uh, let, let me go on to the real post. question, which is, can they salvage? Um, Karen certainly can't, I don't think. But, you know, if you look at Mike Ashley, Mike Ashley, hated by the Newcastle fans, what he did was he put the club up for sale. He took a back seat. He handed over football. Uh, he appointed a football board and really has taken himself away. Doesn't do public interviews. Doesn't do anything. If, you know, you've got to think that there are, if you think that 14% of the, the um, West Ham is owned by Trip Smith, Terry Brown, and someone called Daniel Harris, you don't hear from them. There are owners as well. They're shareholders. You don't hear about them because they're silent, they own their shares, they go to their ball meetings, they don't talk. I agree, someone said, I can't remember who it is, Gold doesn't do interviews anymore. You know, you, you've not seen him in the last six months, maybe more. He, he doesn't engage fans on Twitter, he doesn't talk, he doesn't do radio interviews, he doesn't go on talk sport. We seem to have lost Sean briefly, so uh, we'll just hang around for a few seconds to see if Sean reappears. Perhaps he's been hooked by Karen Brady in the background. Who knows? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to Sean in just a minute. Jim, I'll, I'll come on to you as, as we've lost Sean uh, briefly uh, for your take on this. Um, yeah, the question is, you know, is, is that uh, perceived rift between the board and the fan base irreparable? Can anything be, be, be done to, to repair it? I think in, in theory, I, I think it probably is salvageable. I, I think there are very few relationships really in the world which are completely unsalvageable. And West Ham fans aren't a collective, <laughs> as this group probably know better than, than, than any other, really. You know, so there are probably quite a lot of moderate fans who, you know, drift in and out of the club and, 
probably don't pay as, as much attention as we do to the minutiae of it. And therefore it probably is, is, is fixable. I think the problem is that all of us, and uh, I, 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 I would be surprised if anybody here disagreed with this statement, I, I don't think they, they would do the things necessary to fix that relationship. Um, and what's really sort of frustrating about it is I don't actually think it would be that difficult. You know, if you were to, you know, if, if I put myself in David Sullivan's shoes, because I think he's the key person, I, as others have said, I think gold is, is really a silent partner. Um, you know, if, if Sullivan was to appoint somebody to, to run and, and build an infrastructure like the guys at Red Bull or Brentford or Atalanta or any of these clubs on the, on the continent who are run in a, in a modern um, kind of data driven way, look at Liverpool, those sorts of places. If he was to put that kind of structure in place, invest in scouting, invest in the academy, um, kind of <laughs> stop doing whatever it is he's currently doing, get rid of the agents, all that kind of stuff, step yeah. away, get his kids out of it, you know, no more no more teenagers in the corner while he's interviewing managers. Um, dispense with Brady and put somebody in charge who will work, number one, full-time for the club, but number two, try and instill a different culture whereby fans are not viewed um, purely in transactional terms, purely in monetary terms, which I think is how we are viewed at the moment. If he did all of those things, I think pretty much every fan would, would, would be okay with that. And you would expect, to be honest, that results on the pitch would improve. And... To Sean's point earlier, he might be surprised, but I would agree with him that actually I think fan sentiment goes as the team goes. And basically, the reason that fans are up in arms or the, the magnifying glass over fan sentiment at the moment is the fact that the team is bad and has been bad for quite a while. So, look, I think there's a way he could fix it, but I don't think he's going to do any of those things, which sort of brings me back to the original point of can Sullivan fix it? Is that is that relationship uh, fixable? The answer is no, because he's not going to do the things that, that fans would, would demand in order to soften their stance. Excellent. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Andy, you've been waiting very patiently um, for your turn at this one. Uh, your last uh, on this particular question. Uh, the, the question is, of course, uh, about the rift between the board and the fans. Is there anything that can be done to salvage it? Uh, I'm guessing you're, you're about to tell me no, there isn't. Well, I can't imagine what it would take for them to fix it. And I think a lot has already been said before, but I'll go back to the point I made earlier. All of the stuff that they should have been doing, they haven't been doing. So there's no evidence that suggests they're suddenly going to turn on a sixpence and start doing it. I mean, you, you, you've got the free, free principal people there. Um, yeah, David Gold has taken a back seat. I'm even prepared to go along with the notion that he really is a West Ham fan and he lived at, was it 442 Green Street and used to bunk in, etc. I'm prepared to go along with that. So I'll cut him a little bit of slack. But the other two, personally, I can't cut many slack whatsoever. And I mean, I think we're fairly unanimous on this panel and probably across the fan base anyway. Brady has to go. Mm -hmm. um, to me, she's been more of a mouthpiece for this club than the other two put together. Um, she's turned us into a laughing stock. I mean, comments in the press, comments on social media, comments in public speeches where she references West Ham, it's all bringing embarrassment onto West Ham. Um, she was, the, the, to me, the principal architect of that move from the bowling. She was the one who got up there on the videos talking about retractable seating and world-class stadiums, et cetera, et cetera. All of it was nonsense. When I went to the Juventus game, and believe me, I wanted to be proud of our new stadium. I really, yeah. really did. When I walked into that ground and I saw all the people, for a moment, I thought this might work. And then I had a little look below and I saw what was meant to be retractable seating and it was all scaffolding, held together with what looked like bulldog clips. <laughs> and that was when I knew it was all over. And she's got the front to come out and say it's the most successful migration in history. It's absurd. I mean, even, even to the point where they, they've reconfigured the, the, the seat in behind the goals. How much United got inundated with people saying about we've been moved, family split up, friends who have sat together for, yeah. for years have all been split up. And she comes out and says, what was it, another great leap forward, another step forward in, in the, the, the progress of the stadium. She's like that character off the file show. Everything's brilliant. She cannot accept the responsibility. She mm -hmm. has to go. And honestly, in any other world, she would be down the road, out the door, down the road. But this is the GSB world. I, I don't understand what she's still doing here. She has to go. 
I would cut Gold a bit of slack because he's kept quiet. Mm -hmm. And Sullivan, I don't even know what he's for. I really don't know what the point of him is. Because as a club, I mean, we've, we've fought relegation pretty much year in, year out, apart from what, one season where we had a decent season. We can't put a cup run together. We lose to teams in leagues lower than us. We can't appoint the right managers. I mean, we, we've had, I think, count them always twice. We've had what, seven managers or seven managers appointed in 10 years. How many did we have in the last 100 years? Yeah, this goes on. We sell the wrong players. We can't track the right ones. They embarrass us in public. It, it, it's, I mean, they got called the Dildo Brothers. If this was happening at Spurs, we would be pissing ourselves laughing. We really would. But everyone is laughing at us. And that's down to them. So hopefully I've made my, my point clear where I stand. There's no way, there's no way on earth that I can see that they are going to turn that around. No way at all. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, I think uh, pretty clear where you stand from from that uh, uh, little speech there. Uh, can, I, can I just ask, is there anyone on the panel who is directly affected by the reseating behind the goal and who has who's been moved? Yeah, I've been moved. Steve, you have. And, and uh, in your view, is it a, a better position you're going to be at? And, and have you I've been no moved idea. friends? I've no idea. They've just given me a CGI, you know. So right. <laughs> it's, I thought it was quite funny because it's the same CGI as we got before we went there, you know, where they yeah. gave you the view. So they gave me another CGI view. Okay. I think I've got, I think I've got a fence next to me now to my left, but I've got no idea where my mates are either. We just thought, well, we're not be going anyway this year. Actually, we'll we'll worry about it. There's not going to be a queue, is there? Oh. Uh, it's unlikely at the moment, isn't it? Just in in terms of season ticket renewals, those of you that were season ticket holders, uh, let's have a quick show of hands to to see who has renewed this season. Okay, pretty much, pretty much everybody. Uh, so, uh, and once again, another show of hands. Have, have you re renewed fully, or are you uh, just on the deferral scheme for next season, the thirty percent option? Anyone on the thirty yeah. percent option? Yeah, Jim and George and, and Steve as well, and Sean, I think, or is Sean stuck again in uh, in the ether? I don't know why. I think <laughs> you seem to be stuck. Oh, you, I think why. we're there, Sean, but we're we're having difficulties um, getting hold of you. Um, right now, your, your video's not, not coming through. Um, but um, yeah, so it's interesting stuff there. But Sean, I just want to come back to you quickly because we did lose you uh, midway yeah. through uh, your little speech. Is there anything else you wanted to add before we move on? No, I don't know where he got up to, but I, okay. I was suggesting, um, you know, it was about, you know, be quiet, don't say anything. Be, be like Mike Ashley, where you just... Don't engage with the fans at all. Don't do interviews. Don't do anything. If if you want even, you you won't get your credibility back. Okay, we, we you're cutting out again there, Sean. So I'm 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 going to move on uh, now. I think we got the gist of what you were saying. Uh, essentially, the board really need to button it and not speak to the media anymore, um, which is of course something they've consistently told us that they're not going to do. David Sullivan, of course, uh, said towards the end of last year, I think it was, that he would be doing no more interviews with the media, etc. And of course, there he was uh, a couple of weeks ago in uh, what has been described as a car crash of an interview with uh, Mr. White of TalkSport. Um, another thing that didn't go down particularly well with the fan base. Talking about the fan base, we learned recently that uh, in excess of 80% of season ticket, coming back to what we were just saying there, uh, it's about 88%, I think, of season tickets were renewed this year, uh, even despite the current situation and the pandemic. Um, but as uh, was pointed out, Andy, I think you pointed out earlier, um, talking about Tross's reference to the old South Bank, I think it was, uh, that uh, number of non-renewals equates to about 6,000 supporters. So a similar number to the, you know, the, old, uh, the old South Bank there. And of course, it's not the first year we've seen this. We've seen a similar sort of figure you know, in each of the last three or four seasons. So, you know, it, it, we're, we're all guessing, but the, the estimates are that probably in excess of 20,000 diehard, hardcore, old school West Ham supporters are no longer season ticket holders and potentially no longer going to games at the ground. Um, I'm just wondering, I mean, this sort of ties in with the, with the question I've just asked. So let, let's sort of go through this one fairly quickly, but... 
I'm sure all of us know someone who's in that particular situation, someone who's, you know, been going to the games for many, many years and has just given up um, since we moved to Stratford. Um, do we, does the panel see any way uh, in which those supporters can be won back? And if so, how? Um, I shall start this particular round of questions with Steve, I think. Um, well, with GSB gone, maybe, as I say, I think that is the defining moment. And I okay. think people might start to come back. So you think you, it's more that than the stadium, Steve, more the, more the administration? Yeah, I'd like to think so. I okay. think it's depressing to, to contemplate otherwise, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. No. Uh, and also, I think it, things can be constructively changed. You know, the, the stadium, I'm not sure about the stadium itself. I think, personally, that we have to get out of there to get our club back. I think while we're there, it's a millstone. And... Um, I'm not talking so much about the design. I'm talking about the whole concept of the place and I and, and the ability of doing an awful lot with it. So yeah, I think we can get them back, but I, I'm not sure we can get it. Certainly, I know we can't get it back with GSB there and mm -hmm. I'm pessimistic and doubtful that we can get them back while we're in that stadium. Okay, thank you. Um, Jim, I'll come to you next on this one. Uh, again, I'm sure you know plenty of people that uh, no longer attend that, that once did. Um, Steve thinks we, we have to get out of the stadium eventually, but uh, you know, do you see some way that we can get those you know twenty thousand or so fans back? Because we're talking about you know a really major section of the club support, aren't we? Uh, we are, and I think it's also it's not a small thing to give up your season ticket. I know, I know. I mean, you know, we have to um, factor in the backdrop of there is a lot of economic uncertainty. People have lost jobs, you know. So some, for some of those people, I suspect it might be financial, um, okay. but. I, I do think actually for for a lot of people it's a statement um, I I think um, I think I agree with Steve but probably pretty much everything that Steve just said really with, with the possible exception that I think leaving the stadium I'm not sure I mean the, the problem with I think there's some physical problems with the stadium right I mean it's it's built on a Indian burial ground or something right so there's there's like nuclear waste underneath it so they can't dig yeah. down so you can't um, you can't sort of get the rake on the on the um, stands any better than they are. Mm -hmm. um, or I think I, I read some article once which basically said you'd have to knock down three sides of the stadium yeah. in order to get it to look, you know, something like Spurs. Uh, so, so practically, is, is that even possible? You know, I don't, I don't really know who, who buys a club and does that with the exception of like the Qataris or something who, you know, do own all of that land. So, there, you know, there is a possibility there, I suppose. But, but you know, practically speaking, I'm not sure if that's feasible. Um, so... You know, Steve may be right. I mean, maybe the only way the club moves forward is you just buy yourself out of a lease and then um, and then go and build another stadium. That's a very expensive way to do it. Um, but you know, broadly speaking, I think if people have made the commitment, or oddly made the commitment not to go, I think that there's there's a strength of feeling about that. I think there's probably quite a lot of people who just actually hate going to the ground. I, it's 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 difficult to get to. Getting in and out is horrible. It's not a yeah. pleasant experience. Um, and generally the football's been poor, so there's, there's not really a lot to commend it. So I think there are a lot of people who actually just don't like going into the Olympic Stadium. But I think a lot of people just don't can't stand the owners. And for those people, I suspect the only way you get those back is a change of regime. Um, so, yeah, and probably seconding a lot of what Steve just said there. OK, thanks, Jim. Um, George, uh, what's your view on this? You know, we, we reckon there's probably up to 20,000 20, 20, supporters uh, that no longer go. Um, have they gone for good? I mean, we, we also hear about a waiting list of some 50,000 supporters. Um, whether or not they'll materialise or not remains to be seen. But uh, um, is that it for these for these fans? Is, is there any way back? First of all, I don't think there is a waiting list of the 50,000. I think that's just a con by the club to say, oh, if you go, there's someone else ready to take your seat. Um, and to the original question... Um, I don't think you're going to get a lot of people back. Um, a lot of people have left uh, for a couple of reasons, one being the owners, the other being the stadium. And until you rectify both of those problems, I don't think you'll get them back. Yeah, it's definitely uh, a view that's been expressed many times. I mean, you see it on Hammers United's chat and also a lot of the other groups and forums out there um, that people will just, you know, have just got no intention of returning. Um, Sean, um, what can the you know what can the club do to get these fans back? Do they even want them back? You know, are they quite happy? Is Karen Brady quite happy with her extensive waiting list that uh, means that all <laughs> of these fans can be replaced? 
I, I think it's different for different people, but I think the club think they can just replace them. I mean, my my co-hosts on the podcasts say they will come back if the current board goes. Mm-hmm. I know other people who are friends with at the bowling ground never came to the London Stadium anyway and would yep. never go back. So, And some people just say, look, it's not the same match day experience. You know, I used to go to the, you know, the castle or... Uh, the Green Gate, which are now gone anyway locally, or, or the Bowling Tavern or the Black Line. And, and, and some of them had sort of drifted away before because the whole thing had changed. The, the waiting list doesn't exist. And, and, and the last thing I did as OSB, I, I chaired a ticket meeting, and at that ticket meeting, the marketing department who run the waiting list said, yeah, we're going to get rid of it and run it season by season. So you have to opt back in. The 50,000 that one, once existed were in 2016 and they basically remained on the list for life but in reality many of them paid the tenor had no intention of, of buying the season ticket so now they wrote to all those 50,000 and asked them whether they want to opt in or not most didn't so technically the, the waiting list gets opt out you know gets wiped out every season mm-hmm. they will struggle you know they will struggle to fill those seats now as you say I think the bowling ground had about what best 26,000 season ticket holders yeah it was around that, that was it that, 25, 26, it was a record yeah. by the way that last season was a record yeah you know a lot of that before but it was 20,000 um so you know I know a lot of people that I used to know at the bowling ground that no longer go um my best mate doesn't go anymore his son doesn't go anymore um and Nigel is, is the stadium or because of the owners or, or both uh, mostly because of the the stadium, uh, okay. but now they're saying they might come back if 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 the ball goes. Okay. okay. Um, so I think it's different for either people. Can they replace the people? Not unless they make the tickets even cheaper. You start giving them away, making the seasons cheap. Yeah, but we both know there's a big tourism draw, and, yep. and the sad truth is we're in London, and those empty seats will be fin- uh, filled by tourists, and and often we see that. Do you think that, that that's a bit of a myth, though, that um, you, know, you, you often hear a reference to the term plastics to describe the, you know, the, the kind of fair weather fans or people that come along? Do you, do you think that's kind of overblown a little bit or there's, you know, that, that's, that's uh, um, quite truthful we, in, in essence? We, we did see a lot of people in that first year at the London Stadium. I saw a lot of, I don't like using that word plastics, but people who didn't understand the commitment you've got to do to go to football every other week or, or yeah. for some people every week. You know, I, I, I don't go to many away games, but every other week you make a commitment. It's a whole day. You know, you've got to have your family situation. You've got to have the money. It's not just about season ticket. It's your train fare. It's the food. It's the drink. It's everything else. And that's a big commitment. And some people don't understand that. And I think a lot of people, when they first got to the London Stadium, thought, yeah, you know, I really want a season ticket for 200 quid. But it's not yep. just 200 quid, is it? So I, I think a lot of, I, I don't want to call them fair weather fans, but but some tried it and it, it wasn't for them. But how many, it'll be interesting to know, and I'd like to know what you think or others do, how many of the original Bolin season ticket holders are still in the London Stadium? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, if 20,000 have walked away, um, they're, they're, you know, we're not talking about, I, I guess, 20,000 out of that 25,000, but no. 20,000 regulars. I mean, it, it, it's anyone's guess, isn't it, really? Um, maybe, maybe as many as half, who knows, of, of the original the know. original number i guess we'll never know will we that's that's the bottom line we we yeah. we can never be sure but uh if anyone wants to have a stab in the dark feel free to to, to throw an opinion out there well, I, I think i, I think um twenty thousand is a big number and yeah. there's going to be people within that number who will come back but yeah. if you consider the days of the bond scheme and what happened to the attendance is there that protest People stopped going because of what they did with the bond scheme. And when they did away with the bond scheme, people came back. And I think the reason they came back is that was their home. That was our home. The Olympic Stadium isn't our home. There's people that have never been there. So to try to get them to come back to our home... I can't see it. So, yeah, yeah, there will be some people, but I think that ship has sailed. And yeah. it's really disappointing. It really is disappointing. I, I, that, that, that's a really good point, Andy, actually, you make, is that, 
you know, there, there was a lot of people, wasn't there? I mean, even even talking about people like um, Gary Firmager, who said, you know, once uh, once we move, that's it. I'm not, I'm not going to go. I'm not interested. Yeah. I've, I've done my time. You know, I've, I've done Olus for whatever it was, 23 years, and that's that. Um, so, you, you know, for those people, are they, are they just not really interested? So, you know, the question of who's in control of the of the club, probably immaterial as far as they're concerned, yes? Uh, I would I would think so, yeah. I think it's it, it, it gone beyond that. And I would, I would hazard a guess, I could be wrong in this, but I think they probably saw in that move to the new ground what we're all experiencing right now. Right. It's just we're... Get, getting that experience, maybe on a day-by-day -day basis. They saw it for what it was and knew what was going to happen. And again, I mean, it, it, it's it's so, so sad and disappointing what's gone on. And that, that is, so, you know, that, that's such, such a large number of die-hard loyal supporters yeah. that feel that way. doesn't mean they're not supporters anymore. They'll mm -hmm. find a way of supporting the team. They'll find a way of seeing those games, but they're not going to do it inside the London Stadium. It's it's just shocking what's going on. Eamon, the it's it's four years now since we moved from Upton Park to Stratford. Uh, there's been a few changes. Uh, you know, we've we've seen obviously there's there's no fighting in the stands, or at least if there is, you know, you don't see it as as much as perhaps you did in those first few months when uh, no one seemed to know what was going on. Uh, in terms of what the club have done to try and resurrect the the many issues that have been raised. Um, how successful do you think that policy has been? And do you think essentially they're wasting their time in trying to? Uh, to a certain extent, yeah. Because if you take the, you know, the much talked of match day experience, horrible phrase, but you know, what we'd all know is our day out. Where the stadium's physically located relative to a pub you can get served in. You know, the actual size of the crowds trying to get back to stations and, and people will say, oh, well, go to Hackney Wick or go Pudding Mill Lane and all the rest of it. Yeah. The reality is, the sad thing for me, you turn up at Stratford Station and you see our senior citizen supporters having to be bussed around to the ground. So, so the fact that we've had to put in a special provision to move those who aren't as fit as, as the, maybe they once were, just to get to the ground, tells me that the very concept of it is flawed from the start. And you know, tinkering around the edges with things like, we'll stick up a beer shelf. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll call it the Billy Bond stand. And as, as lovely as that was for Bill, the reality is, He's nothing to do with that stadium. He's never played a game there. Yeah. And that's just another example of the club using, in my opinion, a bit of cheap and tacky sort of uh, labelling to try and carry a bit of you know, favour with the supporters. And, and they really are, in my, in my view, wasting their time on all this because ultimately what will, what will solve their problem and it won't happen in Mr. Gold and Mr. Sullivan's lifetimes, is the generation of supporters we have who are seven or eight years old, who are going along with the £99 tickets, who had never been to the bowling ground, who had never had their own match day routine at the old uh, ground. They're perhaps less hacked off with the stadium than some of the people of uh, our generation, if I can call it that. So in 40 years' time, yeah, the ground will have supporters in it that will say, well, this is all we've ever known, yeah? That's 40 years down the line. What do you say to the, to the pensioners currently who, who have got this awful, awful day out and after, yeah, at the end of a four or five nil drubbing by Man City, <laughs> you, you can then go and queue for 45 minutes to get to Stratford Station and you can be treated like a pariah by the shopping centre, yeah, it's just hideous. And for me, you know, where was the proper consultation with supporters before the move mm -hmm. to talk through these issues? And had the club been honest and transparent and properly communicative with the supporters, 
I think a lot of the ill will could have been avoided because actually the supporters would have said, no, look, Mr. Gold, Mr. Sullivan, you need a different plan because that one isn't going to work. And the reason why we've got thousands who have walked away is they're saying it doesn't work and it's never going to work for those people. And for me, you know, the little clues, we're asking there about how many of the original bowling season ticket holders have walked away and things like that. The fact that we had founders badges, founders for a club that had been around for 100 years, founders, you know, you know, History begins. History begins, of course. Yeah. So all this stuff was just chucking it back in the faces of people who have been going for years and years and years. And I often wonder what some of the players, you know, you know, the late great Martin Peters must have thought when he sees a slogan, history begins. That's what we're up against, you know, a, a thought process that really didn't have any thought behind it. Mm-hmm. And, and to me, I think the ones that have walked away, I think an awful lot of them won't be back. I'm not saying the ground will be empty in the 30 years because I think they'll be replaced by different supporters. Mm-hmm. But I just think it's really sad that people who have, who have travelled up and down the land supporting West Ham United have just been discarded so casually by the current regime. I think it's appalling. I really do. Thanks, Simon. Thank you very much. Um, I should add for disclosure purposes, I'm one of the supporters that was formerly a season ticket holder at uh, the bowling ground. I did a year at Stratford and decided it wasn't for me. Uh, So um, I have no intention of going back imminently anyway, uh, for what it's worth. One person who has been back to the stadium, though, of course, this year is George. Uh, As I understand it, George, uh, you've been, I guess the word would be picketing outside the gates uh, in recent weeks as part of the protests uh, how's that been going, buddy? Uh, yeah, I've been part of two groups. You've got Hammers United, obviously, and you've got Crossed Hammers. Um, so those two have pretty much got the same message, which is GSBL and then obviously improving the club. But the way we find it is going to the gates. Um, we obviously see the players when they come through. So we support them. We always have. Always will. But it's more getting a message to the owners and Karen Brady about running the club. As I understand, I think Karen Brady's car passed you, didn't she? Was it last weekend or the weekend before? Uh, Yeah, for the Wolves game, both David Gold and Karen Brady's car saw all at the protest. Yeah. And um, let's just say they were given a rowdy reception. (laughs) <laughs> you, you didn't get the royal wave then out, out of the window I actually our Baroness. I actually um, missed it because we didn't actually see Karen Brady till it was too late yeah and then we were um, we saw David Gold we saw his car so we, um, we I managed to give him some stick but not so much to Karen Brady uh, probably wise that she she avoided that. I would imagine in the in the circumstances. Uh, is that right that Moose from Talksport um, stopped by and was taking pictures of you? I don't know if that was the week you were there. Uh, that was Newcastle. Okay. So that was the first game of the season. Again, same group of people there. Uh, it got recognised by Moose um, and the Sun Sport. So um, that was published in the Sunday paper. Good stuff. Of course, uh, Ian Abraham's no fan of the GSB out movement or Hammers United uh, for that matter, or at least that's what we assume given what he's published uh, via social media. In terms of going forward, George, how do you uh, plan to continue those processes? Do you plan to continue them? And is it very much a case of, you know, you're, you're sort of directed by, you know, whatever the uh, particular government rules are at, uh, you know, any particular time? I definitely plan to keep going. Okay. Uh, after the sale of Brady D and Ghana to West Brom, mm-hmm. uh, me and my dad, who have been season tickets for, uh, holders for four years, have both said we're not going to go back till they yeah. go. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm going to go to the ground for every game I can, um, permitting we obviously safety rules and uh, my studies. So um, I'll be at every game I can protesting, but I won't go back even if we are allowed in till they've gone. Okay, interestingly, I think, and more power to you, George, but I think 
there, there was quite a lot of people like that on the on the march, which we'll, we'll come to very shortly, uh, wasn't there? there? There seemed to be a lot of people, thousands, in fact, I think, that travelled down for the day who had no intention of going into the stadium. Um, I'm referring to that, uh, you know, the march along the Greenway that we that we spoke about uh, a little bit earlier. But um, anyway, uh, it, b before we move on, is there, is there anything anyone would like to add on that particular issue with regards to, you know, the, the latent uh, season ticket holders? We all good? Excellent. OK, we shall move swiftly on then in that case. Uh, one of the main issues um, that uh, has been a, a real concern for the, for the fan base or those who at least feel disenfranchised or um, disenchanted with what's going on at the club is, the, is the, the club's branding. Now, Sean, as you will know, uh, the brand is a big thing for Karen Brady. Um, mm. It talks an awful lot about the brand. Um, but the brand that uh, she seems to uh, like isn't particularly welcomed by the supporters. The whole West Ham London thing, of course, well, it was West Ham Olympic, was it not? Uh, in about 2011, 2012, which uh, Mr. Sullivan moved swiftly to rebuff when she mentioned that. I think it was in a, a newspaper column, perhaps uh, one of her infamous columns many years ago. But, um, you know, th there's a real sense amongst the fan base that the club has lost its way, not just not just because we're not playing, you know, at our spiritual home at the bowling ground anymore, but the, the club's entire identity. Um, Sean, I'll start with you, as I've mentioned you there. What, what, do you, what, what do you think about that? Do you think there's anything in it? Do you think that's perhaps support has been a bit precious? Or, you know, do, do you think that we are well, losing that uh, way? And if so, what can we do to regain it? Of course, we can thank uh, the London on the badge, not for Karen Brady, but actually the chief executive of Leeds. Angus. Uh, so Angus... Angus Kinnear um, wanted to put London on the Arsenal badge when he was marketing director of, of Arsenal and uh, Arsenal wouldn't have it. Mm. So he brought that idea to Karen uh, when he joined as managing director of West Ham. Yep. And, and, and obviously the board had to approve it and, and Karen approved it. But that, that he, he's the reason. And, and interesting, when he moved to Leeds, he tried to change the badge as well, if, if you remember, and there was a bit of backlash. Um, their plan always was, was to create a, a, a brand, a global brand, because the Premier League is a global brand and they want London is a massive brand itself. And, and therefore, in their view, probably I would say Brady is more marketing than she is football, where she doesn't get involved in the football side at all. So yeah. that, that everything is marketing. Mm -hmm. um, the idea is if you can get a a hundred million people to support a London club, then they will buy more merchandise and they want to watch it. And, and your, your viewing figures will go up and everything else. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sometimes you think that maybe, and it's funny this year in, in COVID that we're there for just sort of a little bit <laughs> supporters are there for a little bit of background uh, um, entertainment with the cheering uh, for the TV crowds, because let's be honest, football and Premier League football, is about TV coverage and not about supporters going to the games. The money comes from TV, global TV. And that's why they were so big to push West Ham London uh, on the badge um, to, to, to China and, and, and to the rest of the world. But, but has that, you know, has that worked against the club, do you think? It's, not, it's worked against the grassroots people who object to being rebranded you know i i i got the the castle being taken look i don't care what what's on the badge if i'm being completely honest it doesn't bother me but i can see why why some people have a problem with it you know you okay. you're taking the castle off and putting the word london on there some people said that we should have the word east london but yeah you know it if if i list all my biggest problems the word the, the word london on the badge is, is not the biggest one Okay, good stuff. Thank you, Steve. Um, come to you on this issue next. Uh, Sean doesn't care what's on the badge. Uh, do you care what's on the badge? Yeah, because um, for me, the club is us. Okay. Um, and I, I think it's an ignorance of our roots. Okay. Every club has its own roots. I think if you go to City, okay, they've, they've been twisted and changed out of shape. And still, I can still understand what, where they are somehow. Um, that's to take an extreme. I'm not so sure with Chelsea. I think the Chelsea ball do treat their fans a lot better. 
they do do things like the away trips and stuff and they on specials and they do at least talk to the fans. Um, and it's one of those interesting things, isn't it? Yeah, you can sort of, you know, commercialise the whole thing, but then you lose what, what made it in the first place. And, and where is that line? We, we, we've said for years, haven't we, that we've crossed the line. I remember Euro 96, people were saying we've crossed the line and that <laughs> we've lost our identity back then. And I think to an extent we did, but we know, don't we? There's, there's certain things that happen. It's, it's almost impossible to describe. You see David Martin... At Chelsea last year, if, 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 you know you, if you know your history, if, if you've been there, that's where you get your reward. That's why it's worth going. I, I won't even bother watching it on the telly, to tell you the truth at the moment. I, I jump in a car and I drive for six hours to Newcastle because yeah. it means something. Mm-hmm. And I, you feel a part of contributing to something. But if it's just, I mean, to take it aside, Karen Brady once said to me that a fan in Korea who watches it on telly is as valuable to her as a fan who goes every week. In fact, I think she probably thinks he's more valuable or she is more valuable because she doesn't give her a jip. Um, you know, it doesn't sound out songs that offence and so on. So I think in a way, you know, you can take that view that in order to succeed, you've got to commercialise, you've got to understand the marketing and everything, but you lose what makes it worth going in the first place. And I don't go to win. I go to, for the day out. And, and you keep cutting it bit by bit and then people just don't want to go anymore. If they do go, they, they won't they won't go if you go down. You know, it's one of those, the other thing that's interesting about it philosophically is it works as long as you don't go down. Yeah. It's almost like a Nirvana situation, isn't it? Um, and it, and it's not real. And that's the thing. Karen Brady's come in and, and I think it is her. I, I, I you know, I, Go back to that point. Sullivan has done himself no favours. It didn't need to be like this. Um, she's treated it almost like an apprentice project um, and, and had so little humility or understanding of our roots that, um, you know, you cut it, cut it too far, cut the roots off. Is, is that whole commercialisation, though, you know, doesn't that, doesn't that extend beyond Karen Brady? Isn't that just the way the game's going as a, as a whole these days? Yeah, Being sure. a worldwide yeah. brand, you know, all the Premier League clubs. Of course, but it have to be like this, did it? Just taking it back to sort of like the reality of where we're at. We could have yeah. moved in a different way. Mm-hmm. We could have turned around commercially. It would have made more sense to turn around to all the 25,000 season holders and say, right, you can all go in one part of the ground. We're going to charge you very little much in, indeed. We'll commercialise the upper tier. We'll commercialise one stand. There's a compromise, isn't there? And I, I don't know if City reached it, but they're a damn sight closer to it than we are. Okay, thank you, uh, Steve. Jim, let me come to you on this one. Um, you've written some absolutely fantastic blogs over the years, which um, you know we've been fortunate enough to publish on KUMB. Thanks for that, by the way. Um, and uh, you've had an awful lot to say about this particular issue of Karen Brady and the, the commercialization of West Ham United and the direction the club is going. Um, where, where do you stand on this now, having, you know, sort of looking back on, on all those um, many thousands of words you've written over the, over the past few years? How, how, do, you know, how does the situation strike you now? And, you know, do you think it's too late to get back the very essence of West Ham or, or at least what it used to be? Um, I think it's difficult. Um, and I think pro- probably nigh on impossible while Brady um, is involved. I mean, I, I think you, you hit upon an interesting point around the badge. You know, I mean, the, the badge is sort of emblematic of things, really, literally, but but in, in, a, in a sort of a wider sense. I think it's emblematic of of, of the problem. I, I'm a, I'm a little bit like Sean in the sense that I I'm, I'm a bit agnostic about the badge. You know, when there was this massive kerfuffle about the badge previously, I sort of took a look through history, and there have been 17 different versions of our badge. So, you know, to me, the one that I always, you know, my childhood was the cross hammers in front of the castle. That was really important, but they got rid of it. So, you know, su- such is life. Mm-hmm. But I, I think it speaks to um, a wider kind of ignorance, really, of, of the club. But I think also, I think it speaks to Brady's struggle to see football fans um, as anything other than cash machines. And I think Steve hits the nail on the head, really, about talking about how she approaches things like like an apprentice task. You know, I mean, the, yeah. the idea of getting people to pay £10 to be on the um, on the season ticket waiting list is an idea straight out of The Apprentice. You know, mm-hmm. get, get money for nothing, 
you know, you can you can almost see Alan Sugar sort of, you know, rubbing his hands in glee behind <laughs> uh, behind her as he did it. But but there's there's a lot more. I, I think there's a, there's there's wider stuff than that, right? I mean, you know, things like the mascots, you know, paying having to getting our fans to pay nine hundred pounds or whatever it is for their son or daughter to come and be part of a group of eleven other mascots and maybe get a picture with Josh Cullen at some point in the day. You know, uh, it, it, you know, while while Manchester City and Arsenal are giving it away for free, um, you know, you'll. Uh, you know, Graham, I'm, I'm involved in the grassroots football scene. You know, kids, if they want to play for West Ham and they go and have trials and they're not quite good enough to get in the academy, but they're good enough to be at West Ham, you have to pay. You have to pay £980 a year to be part of their development pyramid and drive all the way out to Stanford, we hope, um, to get training. And, you know, it seems, again, it's a sort of an EQ thing. It's like an emotional intelligence thing. The club don't see any problem with that. They just see that as... as astute marketing because it's a it's a way you can get money out of kids mm-hmm. um I, I just think there is a, there is a disconnect and a failure because i think we are not valued for anything other than the money that we can bring into the club and i do think that is a pervasive feeling all the way through uh, you know elite football i think there's a lot of clubs treat their fans like that but i yeah. don't think any of them are quite so disdainful and quite so obviously disdainful of their fans as as we are and to me that comes back to an article that I wrote and you know you may be talking about this one but you know the culture of West Ham or or more accurately probably the complete absence of a culture at West Ham Mm -hmm. Um, I think that there's a black hole sitting right at the middle of the club where a day-to-day CEO would sit who would have their own personality and their own imprint and they would drive the 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 organization forward think about the best organizations you've ever worked in they all have a very strong brand and a strong culture. That is completely absent at West Ham because, because Brady is a part-time CEO who has pretty much got disdain or, or demonstrates repeated disdain for her customers. Um, so very long-winded way of saying, um, you know, I sort of, I, I, I despair a little bit of that side of, of, of how the club acts because I think it's a pretty easy fix. You just have to give a shit about the people that you and that are buying your product. And unfortunately, at the moment, it doesn't seem like they do. There's, it, it strikes me that you know, throughout this conversation, there, there's a number of easy fixes that, that could be addressed quite simply that for one reason or another, the, the club just don't seem to be prepared uh, to, to, to make. Um, is, is, did you think that's just stubbornness on, on Karen Brady's part? Or do you think there's a wider issue at play there? Whatever that uh, may be. Uh, yeah, I mean, it could... It, it's possibly the most sort of pertinent question I think about the club at the moment. I do think, I, I don't know Brady, obviously I only know her public persona. Um, I get this very strong sense that she's um, really politely stubborn. I think she's got a lot of belief in herself and the way that she does things. Um, so I, I do think there probably is something around Brady's sort of just refusal to accept that anything other than, you know, her way of doing things is, uh, is the right way. Um, I, I think possibly with Sullivan, I think I, I might be wrong. I, I sort of always attribute fairly good intentions to Sullivan, but mm-hmm. I, he's a bloke who made his property, in, uh, made his money, sorry, in porn and then stuck all the money in property. He's not got any experience of running a brand or a large company, particularly, I don't know, he ran Birmingham, but you know, football in itself is such a weird industry. I think Sullivan does the bits of, of running a football club that he likes, which is dealing with agents, dealing with players. He likes picking players and likes, you know, having a real life um, football manager, uh, you know, at his disposal, championship manager at his disposal. Mm-hmm. That's the bit he likes. And I think the rest of it, he just doesn't care about because things like brand loyalty or, you know, synergy with your customers or whatever, all the buzzwords, whatever you want, they don't really apply in porn. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it, you know, Sullivan never had to learn this stuff because it wasn't relevant to him. So he's given all of that over to Brady and you know, not to to continually flog a dead horse, but um, politely, she's probably not the right person to be doing that job at this particular time at West Ham. Cracking, thank you, uh, Jim. Uh, George, let me come to you on on this issue. You know, the the, the whole issue of the club's identity is it, is it West Ham United? Is it West Ham London? Uh, do you you know do you think the club can be salvaged or, or, or is that it now? You know, as, as West Ham United as we once knew it you know, ceased to be, um, without referring to a very old sketch that you probably won't have heard of. Um, but uh, is, it, uh, is it a dead parrot, West Ham United? In a lot of senses, yes. 
like I referred to earlier, I think since we left the boat in, we left a lot of our history, heritage, and a lot of the old fans behind. Uh, I think if it was broached the right way and the club was run the right way, then you might be able to recover some of the feel good factor. That you so, for example, the last season at the Bowling, if we take away the having one more season there, the actual football was really good. I mean, we got top seven, we had players like Payet. Um, but if we can get players like that in, then obviously having good football does paper over some of the cracks. Yeah, I, I guess that that's coming back to the point that Sean alluded to earlier about you know that we, we he made right at the top of the show about um, you know winning football placates an awful lot of supporters and that we, which is a, a fairly solid point I think. But um, it won't it won't do all of it because mm. obviously there's there's been a lot that's been said and done, but I think football it would be an added bonus rather than anything else. Do you, do you think also the fact that you, know, you mentioned uh, Dimitri Payet there. Um, does, does the fact that he was perhaps the last iconic West Ham player that the fans sort of really took to, do you think the fact that we haven't had one of those at, at Stratford um, kind of also, you know, adds to the fact that, uh, adds to the problems really? Uh, definitely. I think we, in my lifetime, I'm, I'm 20 years old. So I've, I've only had three, three or four players I can think of in my lifetime that were the level of Payet. So you've got Scott Parker, Colton Cole, Dimitri Payet, and Paolo Di Canio. There's been no one of that kind of ilk that will drag the team through uh, bad patches or galvanise the fans. Mm -hmm. You look at Colton Cole and Scott Parker, they were playing for us during a dark time, but they still cared enough about the club to get the fans on side. Yeah, um... Certainly, Scott Parker. I was reminded of of Scott. I think it was last week of uh, when West Brom were three 0 up at half time against was it Chelsea? They they played last week, and of course we we'll, we'll all remember the the occasion in which Scott Parker um, led a team talk, and, and Colton Cole I think talks about this quite often when we were three 0 down at the Hawthorns, and you know Parker's um, team talk inspired the team to to come back and take a point that day. But yeah, it's uh, you know you know you you mentioned I think. I'm trying to think of anyone else outside the four individuals you mentioned who, who have it's been, you know. It's symptomatic though of Parker having to do a team talk because again, it, it's getting players to again paper over the cracks. Yeah. Marco yeah. and Altovic for a short period of time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Marco was very influential, wasn't he, for, for a wee while. But um, yeah, I, I suppose that that really, Sean, would be the nearest we've had, isn't it, at the mm. at, at, at Stratford to, to a real iconic, you know, um, fans favorite as it were um andy uh, yeah coming back to yeah. the issue west ham united or west ham london you know hey, well, do you, i'm assuming you think that the club's identity has taken a real battering i'm sure you wouldn't be on the hammers united committee if that wasn't the case but uh yeah I, you, know, I, you guys are I, working I hard there uh, what, what can we do I, well just just in terms of the badge um yeah we have had loads of badges we've had badges about the castle with the castle again um like Jim, I like the one that had the castle, but it changes. There was no need to put the word London on it. Now, taken in isolation up against all the other things that are wrong at the club, yeah, it is fairly insignificant, but it, it shouldn't be overlooked. It was, or it is, yet another now in the coffin of what was West Ham United. Can, can just I just is. ask you and quickly? In terms of the, yeah, yeah, go on. Let me, let me just come in very quickly there. Um, it was mentioned earlier about the possibility of, of putting East London on there. Would would, would that been if so pro, uh, been as no. problematic? Do you think? I, yeah, it, it would have been. Cause we're, we're West Ham United, and that that's all it ever needs to be. Okay. Just in terms of the um, the branding and the commercialisation of it. Well, I think it was about a week ago, wasn't it? That Sully had his little meltdown on Talksport, and he was saying if we were to try and buy a right back or whatever it was, we could go bankrupt. So I can't imagine that all the branding exercises that have been going on at the club have actually paid off. So to, to me, it, it, as I say, it's just yet another nail in the coffin. On its own, in isolation, yeah, largely insignificant. It's like, you know, selling popcorn. Some people don't like it, some people don't give a monkeys. But it's another thing that chips away at what we were all about. It's not as big as knocking down the bowling, 
but it's one of those things that goes towards it and it goes towards everything that's wrong with the club so i don't want to blow it out of all proportion i don't really care about the badge so long as it's got the crossed hammers on it that's the one thing it must have but yeah. it definitely does not need anything other than west ham united on there as far as i'm concerned okay in, in terms of the the, the club's identity I, I suppose it's it's also more about a, a shirt and a badge isn't it and and the players it's, it's it's the whole experience. It's about us, Graham. It's about us. It's about the people, right? <laughs> Managers come and go. Players come and go. Owners come and go. Unless that trend continues. But it's the fans. It's the people who go week in, week out and have done the donkey's years. That's the identity of the club. And this speaks back to what we were saying about 20-odd thousand that have walked away. Yeah. And that's why it's so sad, because that is where, you know, that, that's where a lot of the identity issues are suffering, because those people will not come back into that stadium. And it's really, really sad. So like I say, you know, a badge seems like it's insignificant, but it's a nail in the coffin. Excellent. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Eamon, coming to you finally uh, for, for this particular question. Um, you know, I... It, uh, as I say, you know, extending upon what, what Andy was saying there and, you know, we, we talked about the badge, we talked about the shirt, the players, but, you know, it's, it's everything else. It's, it's the fans, it's the, the whole experience that we we used to enjoy when you, you got off the tube at uh, um, Upton Park and, you know, you'd walk down Green Street and as soon as you left the tube station, you know, you get the, the waft from Urcans come over. Uh, you walk a bit further on and you'd have to step around people pouring out of the Queen's you know, you'd have your program sellers on the other side of the road and uh, Ken's Cafe and so on and so forth. There's been so few or, or essentially no attempts whatsoever to replace any of that. And I, I guess this is kind of a part of it, isn't it? It's it's the whole experience as well as, as, well as you know, what, what we as fans pro provide. But... Okay, okay. I mean, great. Right, I'll come in here. I mean, I mean, first couple of technical points... Urkans was on the barking road, mate. So let's let's have it absolutely right. So if you're going to talk fish and chip shops, yeah, I'm your man. So if you come out of the tube station, <laughs> a it's, dreadful it's error. Fish bar that you, you go to the first one. I, right? I apologise. Let's have it. My hands up. <laughs> so but moving past that, okay, let's talk branding and marketing and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, uh, okay. Well, here's an example. You're not West Ham anymore. Mm -hmm. There you go. That's how effective our marketing has been that the Arsenal supporters can turn up and sing that. And do you know what? We had no riposte. They killed us. They killed us stone dead with that, with one chant, one evening at our so called new home. Yeah. Years gone by, we'd be stood in the bowling ground, yeah, or on an away trip somewhere saying, singing, Will you come to Upton Park? And do you know what? Nobody fancied it. Nobody wanted it. There wasn't a football club in the country that said, oh, great, we've got West Ham next week. So if you want to know about the power of branding and marketing, there it is right there. And we had it. We had the jewel in the crown of English football. And we blew it. We just sold it in a dodgy, shady property deal and moved to a rubbish stadium a mile and a half up the road that had absolutely nothing. And Sean touched on Angus Kinnear earlier, you know, and well played, Angus. You've got yourself a nice career in, in as a football executive. But if memory serves me right, he, he started out at Coca-Cola. I think he was, a, he was a Coke guy. And, uh, you know, they once upon a time had a very successful product called Coca-Cola. And then they decided, now we're going to do a bit of marketing and rebranding, and we're going to call it New Coke. And it bombed. It absolutely bombed. And it damn nearly killed the Coca-Cola company. So didn't he learn anything in his time at Coke? So I'm not really interested in whether or not he wanted to put London on Arsenal's badge. Mm -hmm. The fact that actually he'd tinkered with he'd seen it in close-up and personal professional capacity and he's seen it fail horrendously at one of the world's best marketing led companies that's how dangerous it is to tinker with a with a brand and an image and as i say 
the bowling ground was an integral part of our whole branding. Yep. No doubt about it, because it was a big part of us. In terms of what's on the badge and all the rest at this point in time, I personally don't get too excited because I think it's not just the badge. It, it's what we are. It's who we are. That's that's the brand. Yeah, it's it's not a slogan. It's not something you paint on it or put on a magazine. Mm. You know what the brand is and because it's how it makes you feel. And as a West Ham United supporter, we supported West Ham United when we were kids because of how it made us feel. It wasn't about a slogan. And that feeling has gone. And that's where this board have failed abjectly. That's my view on that. Did, do you think they just failed to recognise that? You know, Karen Brady talked extensively about, you know, the brand, but but there was never any reference to any of that which you've just referred to. There was there talking about, you know, the 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 atmosphere, the old ground. Um, it's failing. How, how is it possible that someone in her position missed all that? It's failing to understand. Birmingham City are a football club. West Ham United are a football club. But they're completely different. Yeah. And, you know, and, and you know, Coca-Cola is not Pepsi-Cola. But they're both soft drinks. And, and it's as fundamental as that. Mm -hmm. I don't think the current owners had any idea what it was they bought. I don't think they had any idea what they were really going to do with it in terms of marketing. And they've missed a trick because, do you know what? They had the strongest brand of our kind of scale of club mm -hmm. in English football. And they've blown it. And as I say, when the Arsenal supporters turned up and said, you're not West Ham anymore, that was them voting with their voices on the success of our so-called brilliant marketing, you know, and our rebranding. And, and, and whether it's the history begins you know, and the founders' badges and all the rest of the stuff, yeah, I think they fundamentally failed to grasp the product, yeah? And if anyone in marketing will tell you that's, that's fundamental to, to any, any, any kind of marketing. They didn't know what they had, and I think they've made a bit of a hash of it. And, and just to say, well, Angus Kinnear, well, he wanted to put the word London up. I understand all that stuff. I really do. You know, I've read... Plenty of UA for technical reports where they will bore the pants off you about social interactions and how many Instagram uh, accounts are you know, mentioning you and all the rest of it. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. It's the supporter who pays at the gate, who actually travels 500 miles to, to wherever we're going. Yeah. Takes three days off work. That's the club. The rest of it is just nonsense. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty damning stuff there. Um, not just from Eamon, but from from everybody uh, with regards to to that particular subject, the branding and rebranding of West Ham United. How the how the current administration failed to uh, adopt and take what we had to Stratford, and it doesn't look like many people feel that uh, we can get that back. But uh, of course, we, uh, we, we shall see what will happen in uh, the very near future. Something related to the near future that I want to discuss now. And, and kind of we're, we're going to wrap up, I think, shortly after this, because we're, we're going to be coming up to a couple of hours um, by the time we've got around to this question. And of course, there's going to be more uh, shows in this mini series to follow. And uh, we don't want to steal everybody's thunder for, for, the, uh, you know, for, for those uh, episodes ahead. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll wrap up now. We want to talk about something that was mentioned earlier, the... Uh, the supporters board. Now, uh, Sean mentioned the fact that some years ago, both he and I and one or two others uh, on this panel were members of the supporters advisory board. I think that's correct, wasn't it? The SAB, uh, which mutated into the OSB, the official supporters board, um, which now looks like uh, becoming the independent supporters board, a third version of that. So, um, Lots of changes, but is it going to be any different? This is the question. Uh, someone who's probably better placed than most people on this panel to answer that, I think it's probably Steve, uh, because as I understand it, Steve, you've been quite heavily involved in negotiations uh, for Hammers United. 
um, with the Fo Football Supporters Association and other bodies uh, with regards to setting this up. So um, obviously some of this is confidential. You can't reveal exactly what's going on, but what can you tell us about the ISB? Is it the ISB? Is it called something else? Uh, and where do we stand exactly with this? Yeah, I think the word board will, probably won't be used for, for various reasons. I think <laughs> there, there was talk of the Independent Supporters Forum, which obviously is ISF, which also yeah. was uh, a bit problematic. A bit, yeah. But uh, the word independent will definitely be in it. OK. Um, so I think looking back, I mean, it's, I don't think there's much point talking about the OSB, and, to be honest, or, or where we are because yep. or, or how we got here. It's dead. I, th I think what happened was the club were taking such a, a lot of stick in the press yeah. about not talking to the fans. And after the demonstration, I think we had that press support. And I think they tried to sort of like get ahead of us somewhat by inviting the FSA to come on board and, and rejig the OSB and turn it into a affiliated body mm -hmm. <clears throat> because it only became untenable. Uh, the MP had written to them. It was pointed out that, you know, there are regulations there. The support liaison officer does have an obligatory role to sort of like liaise, and, and it just wasn't happening, you know, at all. So eventually, uh, it's confidential, I suppose, but a, a draft has been agreed between, I think it's about eight different supporters groups um, who have come together under an umbrella. The club at first wanted it to be uh, another form of OSB. They wanted a vice chair of it that was Karen Brady, no less. Um, and the, basically they would agree whether or not it was operating. But I think the supporters groups have taken it beyond that and said, well, it's nothing to do with you, really. It's us. Yeah. Um, and we've all signed up to a draft to have regulated meetings with them uh, on terms facilitated and shared by the FSA. And I'm, I'm confident about it. There was a fair bit of compromise given by HU. And I don't think this is, it has been discussed, so I think I can discuss it. But there was discussion as to waiting and whether or not different groups should have different, you know, more sway or less sway. I think a compromise has been reached where we're, we all have an equal say within it as a, as a body. Mm -hmm. um, but we all agree with the, the club should still have dialogue with different groups, depending on where they're coming from. As you know, we've had this relationship with WISA, um, which, which I think has worked by being two different organizations. I didn't think we needed to come together. I think there is a diverse spectrum amongst West Ham fans that we try and accommodate. And so just looking into the future, I think regardless of it's GSB or a takeover or, or a, a reformed Mr. Sullivan, um, I think what we're hoping to have is a document that we can basically all sign up to sit around a table and discuss if they want to come and if they're going to refuse to discuss it. I think we want to take the conversation on. We'll start that things that what we're doing now, isn't it? I and mean, that's what I've said about, uh, about being rather confident. I think was are having discussions about who we are, where we're going. And it doesn't matter about GSB anymore. We're having that conversation and, and we, we'll have that conversation after. And if we can codify it, then I'd, into a working group with regulated meetings, facilitated facilitated by the FSA and signed up to everybody. And if they keep what they've been doing so far, which is just, you know, taking realistic steps and, and canvassing opinion of those around them and not doing anything ridiculous extreme, mm -hmm. then I think we can um, have a proper, a proper body. And I'm more confident than Sean. He seems to say earlier that it would just be, you know, another OSB reformed. It's not. It's an independent body. And if Brady doesn't want to talk to him, that's fine, but we'll, we'll talk to other people. Thank you, Steve. Just coming back quickly on one thing there, you, you mentioned uh, Wusser and the fact that, you know, you've, you've retained your independence from each other. Uh, I've, I've heard the question raised before and, you know, we've seen it on the, the KUMB.com forum plenty of times. Um, people have asked why, you know, you haven't merged and, you know, uh, move forward in, in that way. Um, is that something you, you possibly see in the future or do you feel it's best to retain your, your independence from each other and represent your own um, members well it's where we are isn't it it's where it's, we came to it it may not have been by design but it's how, um i've often you know i'm a strong believer that these things come from the grassroots up and not from the up down it doesn't matter what we think should be there it is what is there yeah um we had all that kerfuffle two years ago i don't think it was just a isolated incident frank i don't think it was just sort of like a couple of hot words overnight that caused something to be cancelled i think there is or was 
something quite sinister occurring at the time, to be perfectly blunt about it, um, which was completely disproportionate. All we we're actually interested in is going to football matches. Sure. And I sure. think what HU have done, and which I think we sort of done to their credit, is to restrict the conversation to our day out. The politics is, is what we do on our day out. Um, it may be that there are political issues there it, with a small p, you know, in terms of our own responsibility not to offend people and to, to be inclusive and to be a family. Mm-hmm. I think those, those obligations are on us and they, they, it is necessary for us to try and reinforce that on a match day experience. But any wider issues about sort of like, you know, what goes on in Oregon, for example, is nothing to do with a West Ham supporters group. Um, and, and I think everybody learnt. I think we have learnt from hard experience that regardless as to where the club's going and regardless as to the club sees its identity, we, we need to protect it as much as we can. And I, I know that's what Bubbles wanted. Um, I, I know that's what he had hoped would happen, which was that diverse people would come together and just concentrate on what matters about us going to, our, to see our club and nothing else really matters. And so far, everything's kept to that line and that's why it's been successful, I think. Everybody can understand it. Okay, uh, well, let's hope it continues to, you know, prove successful, and uh, we'll, we'll see what what comes of that very soon. Um, uh, any any idea of, of a timeline? Well, yeah, in terms of the stage, it's, yeah. Sorry, in terms of the stage, a draft's been agreed now. Um, yep. Ashley, who's been fantastic at the FSA, has sent mm-hmm. it to the club, which means Jake Heath, effectively. Yeah. I presume Jake's shown it to the board and has said to them, "Hey, this is what's proposed. Do you want to sit down and talk with these people?" Um, and I think we're waiting to hear from them. That's the state it's at. We had agreed that the terms of it all would remain confidential until it was all final and had gone through. And I think the green light will go out soon. And it will only float, I think, if, if everybody, to some extent or other, sort of like backs it. Um, if, if it's not well drafted, if it's not supported by the larger organisations, it will fail. We've failed ourselves. Um, so, but but I'm confident because it's, I don't think there's anything controversial about it. It's just a, you know, it's just different people sitting down and, and somebody will have a frank conversation. It's not an awful lot to ask for, <laughs> and, and you know, I'm hoping that the message is going home to Sullivan that he should have that conversation. It's in his best interests. I mean, yeah. you know, well, that's ultimately stop. the bottom line, isn't it? It's you yeah, know, it you is. want to and work with the club, not against the club. And I think it's as simple as Brady stopping it. I do think that. I mean, Sean can maybe able to throw some light there. Okay, I'll, I'll come to Sean in just a minute. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, hold your fire there, Sean. We'll, we'll come to you and talk about the, the new board and, and what preceded it in, in just a moment. Andy, um, if I can come to you first as another member of uh, the Hammers United Committee. I mean, I presume you also have been working very um, hard on putting all this together, as well as all your other duties um, that uh, you're involved with as part of, uh, part of that uh, particular supporters group. Are you, are you confident, as confident as Steve is that uh, this is going to prove hugely beneficial and, you know, it's something that's going to work out? Yeah, I, I think so. And, and to be honest with you, I think Steve has said pretty much everything. Um, mm. I haven't really got anything to add to it. All, all I would sure. say is, for God's sake, don't call it the greatest supporters ball because those initials, <laughs> man, it's, it's never going to work. So, but other, otherwise, no, I'm totally <laughs> happy with it. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm so, sorry, Andy. I mean, I've come to you there right after Steve has given us a fantastic and very detailed uh, response so uh, not much to add but thank you anyway for, for adding that that small contribution Jim uh, l- let me come to you you're, you're again this is something you've written about um, often uh, is proper supporter representation uh, as far as the board goes um, are you confident that you know we've seen the SAB foul we've seen the OSB foul Sean who is um, essentially head of that particular organization walked out in disgust um, a year or so ago, whenever it was, uh, do you have faith that you know this next incarnation can be a success? Uh, well, I mean, it's it's news to me, I suppose, in the sense that you know Steve's very eloquent description of it there is, is probably the first time I'm hearing of it. Uh, yeah. I'm incredibly encouraged um, by what Steve's just said. I mean, I yeah. I know Steve a little bit and would um, uh, you, the fact that he's involved actually at the level he's involved in gives me confidence before you know I, I even sort of start to think about the details of what he's just said. Mm-hmm. Um, if I, if I think about why things like the OSB fail, um, you know, it, it's on a pretty, it's pretty basic, but the, the, on a basic level, I don't like being told who represents me, you mm-hmm. know, and, and I think a lot of other fans felt the same. So I think the very fact that 
and what Steve's talking about there is a group which is not being put together by the club but which is a group of people coming to, together independently to represent us being fans to the club mm -hmm. is important that's an important distinction um to the OSB and I immediately welcome that because in the you know in the first instance it's not Karen Brady telling me who, who represents me and I say this with the greatest of respect to Sean and the other people on the OSB because I, I, I believe I have no reason to believe anything other than that they got involved for, for the best interests of the club and they had nothing but the best interests of the club at heart. But there is a fundamental problem when people purport to represent you and you have no way of removing them. You know, that's a sort of a, a fundamental failure of, um, of democracy, right? You know, if people are uh, uh, a representative of something, then they ought to be uh, in a position to be removed from that as well. Uh, I appreciate that there's elements of this which are confidential, so I'd like to sort of understand more as it becomes more public. But, uh, you know, broadly speaking, if, if what Steve is saying is that there's a group of um, different supporters organisations who come together with the view of representing the club, uh, sorry, representing the fans to the club, and they're doing it under the auspices of the FSA, um, that encourages me greatly. I, I know a little bit about the FSA um, as well, and I understand about the affiliate status and so on. And I think if, if that group could get affiliate status, uh, which I presume is something that probably, you know they'd be looking at down the line, uh, mm -hmm. that would be a really important step in sort of legitimizing them as a group. So uh, more power to Steve and Andy and everyone else who's involved in it. And I, I really hope it's successful because I think I'm right in saying we are one of the very few clubs who have no uh, supporter representation of this type. And uh, it's crazy. <laughs> so I, yeah, I wish Stephen again the best of luck. Excellent. Thanks, Jim. And, and who knows, we, we might be able to get another H list uh, talking about the new construct when it, when it comes around, hopefully, who knows? I might sharpen um, the pencil. Yeah, very possibly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure everybody would look forward to it if, if that was the case. George, um, as, as a rank and file supporter, um, are you confident that, you know, this can finally be uh, the, the support of representation uh, that you've been looking for and that the fan base as a whole has been looking for, someone who can stand up and, and speak for the fans to, to the club? Uh, hopefully, yeah. I mean, I am i don't know too much about what all of this is because mm -hmm. uh, I've recently got involved with all of this kind of thing. But hopefully, if we can have more dialogue with the club, it's uh, only going to be a good thing. Yeah, I mean, that that's that's the important issue, I guess, isn't it, that... You know, since the, the OSB that we refer to, the official supporters board, kind of fell apart, there, there, there hasn't really been any support or representation at, at any level. I mean, we, we've had various, as Sean will know, you know, over the years, we've had various meetings and things with the club, with Karen Brady, uh, the, the content creators meetings that were put in place some years ago when we moved to Stratford. But there's never really been um, an organisation that can, you know, has, has probably got any clout and I guess George that's that's something that we need right oh definitely definitely um I think if you've got a group of people that the club takes seriously more than anything else then they know that they can't just fob them off with like easy answers and sort of sound bites so someone that's going to look more deeply into the running of the club strength in numbers basically I guess is what what we're saying there and yeah uh, that's what that's what we need. Um, thanks, buddy. Thank you, uh, Eamon, um, You, of course, are someone who's uh, spoken at length and um, passionately uh, about the need for proper support or representation um, within the club. Um, again, same question to you, really. That I asked Jim. Are you confident that you know this is the answer, and at last we're going to be properly represented by um, you know a, a bunch of or, or a proper team of. Uh, individuals who can who can take that uh, the, the whole thing forward I, th I think it's a move in the right direction for sure because you know the, the important word is independent mm -hmm. you know so so it was vital to me is they're not you know they're not seen as just being the the, the deliverers of the club policy they actually have a voice in terms of trying to shape the club's thought process about what the policy should be and and you can only do that if you're independent. And we're not talking about global revolution here. These are these are th you know, what affects supporters: ticket prices, ticket allocations, where people sit. You know, can we get late trains back from Liverpool on a Tuesday night? Why why are there no drop-off points for 
coaches around London. You know, what, why do single female you know, supporters have to be worried about getting dropped off you know, at one o'clock in the morning on a club coach after a long away trip mm-hmm. and then got to walk a mile to their car? Those common sense things that most clubs would talk to their supportive representatives about, we just don't have. And and we're so far behind in those basics, you know, that, that, that almost anything should be a step forward. But number one for me is independence um, and that the supporters have a voice. You know, is, I'm almost not bothered who the voice is, as long as it's a genuine voice that is independent of the club and is not controlled by the club. And all the little clues, that, that, that the dealings that, that, that I've seen with the club over the years, you know, how they, they want to control the minutes. They want to edit who says what and what's released and all the rest of it. Yeah. Well, no. No, you know, it, it, it's full and frank and transparent and sensible and the club talking to supporters reps as adults and as essentially partners in this great enterprise this thing we call West Ham United Football Club you know, the clues in the word club you know and that's where I'm coming from you know it, it, it's 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 a recognition that supporters are integral to the club are the club and we're not an irritating sort of like car bunkle attached to the side of it. So for me, it sounds promising. Um, and more than anything is if they can get that working, even if the club changes hands, which a lot of us on this call want it to, there is a body there that are independent of the club that could talk to new owners and say, well, we, we, we represent supporters. Yeah. And I think, I think that would be a real positive for us. Good stuff. Thank you, Eamon. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that that really s- sums up everything we've been talking about tonight, isn't it? That that whole disenfranchised feeling of a lot of supporters, you know, not being represented. This is something that we've really needed um, for many years. Um, someone who did try to do that um, up until fairly recently was uh, the final member of the panel to comment on this particular issue, uh, who is Sean Um, who was, of course, involved heavily with the OSB, the official supporters board, a construct set up by Karen Brady. Uh, Would that be 2017, Sean? It all blurs. I first joined the SAB, I think, in 2011, but yeah. Yeah, the the SAB, but when did the OSB come about? I think you're right, about 2007. It wasn't just after. But um, before we get into that, Sean, I mean, you were, as I said, you were quite heavily involved in that organisation and... and Mm. Let's be honest. You you were quite heavily criticised uh, for your for your role in that, and, and probably still are to this day. Probably <laughs> some of the effects of that is still being felt. Um, before we get into it, why did you leave? I think it was about a year ago. You you you, you handed in your notice. No, I, I I told the the reason is, and may, maybe I need to explain a bit. When when we started the OSB, it was this is not going to be Sad Mark Two. This is going to be a proper independent. And, and when we voted for the chairman, David Baker, uh, and, and Jim as the vice chairman, we said to Karen, we want this to be independent. You know, we're, we're the initial, you know, we had to apply and it was independently vetted by, I don't know, um, Trevor Brooking and Carton Cole. And, but we wanted to become independent. And, and, and they said, yeah, 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 we need to get. So, so a year went by and I was at a meeting and we were being chaired by Karen Brady. And I said, well, hang on. Terms of reference says our year is up. And she said, oh, yeah, well, we just roll it over another year. And I said, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't have a terms of reference and just vote ourselves in another year. So we then had a conversation. To be fair, it was led by David Baker saying, we think we should have independent elections. And without asking anyone, Brady said, show of hands, who thinks there should be independent elections for the OSB? I'm not going to say, four people put their hands up. Me, the, the I'm, I'm going to say who else, <laughs> but I put my hand up and three others. And Brady said, there you go, there's, democratic, <laughs> there's the democracy for you, Sean. Only four of the 18 people. And I said, hang on a minute. They didn't know what they were voting for. We haven't put this on the paper. That's just unfair. 
And she said, all right, well, we'll bring it back. And when it came to voting ourselves for another year, I abstained. And she said, well, what are you talking about? You, what, what are you saying? And I said, well, I think that's obvious. This is my last meeting. I abstained from voting myself in for another year. The rest did. Um, and she said, why? And I said, because this, this um, body has no credibility with the fan base. And she seemed to not understand that. And she said, well, what do other clubs do? She seemed oblivious to that. Everybody on that board, I can tell you, was had the best intentions. You know, the idea of nodding dogs and everything else, there were some challenges. But my problem is, and it still is, often it was a tick, a tech, a tick box exercise, both the SAB and the OSB, because they had to consult. Nine times out of ten, the club already knew what they wanted to do before they asked us. There's some exceptions. Yes, picking pies and... And, you know, there was a ticket meeting. There was some actual things they conceded on. And also there was some other bits like the the the, um, the uh, shirt and the, the kit. But most of the important decisions Karen Brady makes because she's a control freak. And my concern is going forward, if the club are involved in this, and from my understanding, they're chairing these virtual meetings. Jake Keith, really good guy, by the way, works really hard. But at the, the end SLA of the day, yep. he's, he's got no power within the organisation. This is run by the media department. That should tell you something. This is controlled by the media department and the marketing department. So it's more about media and marketing being seen to do the right thing, do the right thing. And my concern is, without Brady, it's a waste of time. With Brady, she's not going to listen. She's going to make her mind up. So you're, you're, it's sort of an echo chamber. And, and my last point on this is, and I found this out the hard way. I put a lot of time and effort going to these meetings, as I know you did in the early days. Most people have got complete apathy for it. You know, you talk about committees and minutes and everything, and people go, I don't know, I just watch football. I want to go and watch football. You only can change a club if they're willing to listen. And my concern is, as we go back to the original thing, Brady being the problem, how can you affect change if the person who actually controls change doesn't listen. And that's that's my concern. Sean, sure I'll just okay. start. Yep, go on, please. please uh, on that point, Sean, sorry, 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 Graham. Uh, I just, I understand the point about apathy and I, and I do sort of, I, I take the broader point, but that's not really true of everything. You know, so when, for instance, um, season tickets are bodged in terms of how the renewal is, is put yeah. out there or what Eamon was mentioning earlier when when the club ignored a, a previously uh, you know adhered to agreement all that kind of stuff then fans become interested in it and I think you know fans representative bodies are a little bit like the NHS in the sense that you don't care about it until you need it and then you need it very desperately and then I you really want you. it so you know I, I, I think I, I sort of take the point but I, I quite like Steve's approach earlier of saying it's not about them, it's about us, us being the fans, us being the organisation that's being put together. And I think that's the right road to take. I think fans have to say, this is our organisation, these are our representatives. Engage with us, don't engage with us. I mean, I will point out that the there is a Premier League requirement or a UEFA requirement for nice. clubs to engage with their fans. So they can't nice. just keep fobbing off fans' organisations. They have to do something. Um, and if the OSB no longer exists, there's actually no other game in town for Brady to do this. Or sorry, to, 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 to meet that mandate, to, to, to meet with fans. So I think that Steve is doing the right thing and Hammers United and everybody else. Mm. You know, and I think the fact that Brady doesn't want it, I would agree with you, Sean, I think that's right, but I don't think that's enough reason to, to, to not do it. In fact, probably quite the opposite. It's, it's worth trying, but my concern is it, we, we just go round in circles. If she doesn't want to listen, she doesn't want to change. It, it actually builds expectations it wastes time for everybody and we just go back to where we, we were again I hope I'm proved wrong but it, it I've seen it I've seen eight years of it and and I, I keep on but saying I the say, next time sure. will be different I think I, I, I think that's I do think that's a reasonable point sorry I you know I keep no, carry on, Jim. Go make on, this my, carry on. my my last comment you know I, I think that one of the problems with the OSB was it's very interesting to already out of that of that actual proper engagement with fans. And the existence of the OSB and the fact that she could control those meetings and do all the things that you just laid out, which I would agree with you are not kind of in the spirit of fan cooperation at all. The existence of that organization allowed her to abscond away from her responsibilities to engage with fans. 
if the OSB no longer exists, she has to engage with someone. And therefore, I would make the, the argument that this group that Steve's putting together and, and others are putting together, it, that's the only game in town. She has to engage with someone. Why not have a proper group that's properly led with proper um, independence and proper objectives? Sean, do you want to come back on that point quickly? I, I, my only concern is they still try and control it. They can try and control, control the agenda, control the minutes, what's said, etc. The, the model that Daniel Levy uses at Spurs is it's he meets with the Spurs Trust, i.e. there's a sit-down with a cup of tea and any issues are brought directly to him. That is a model, and I think a few other clubs do it. There, There is no organisation, there's no... The club's not involved, you know. They're a separate body like the Spurs Trust, and they sit down with the chairman and say, these are our grievances. Sometimes they say, well, tough luck, you know. I've listened, but <laughs> tough luck, because that's what Levy is. But but my concern is if the club's involved, they will want some kind of control. And sure, I, I sure. hope I'll prove wrong. Sure. Um, Eamon? At the heart of this, of what you're saying, is this is the disdain that Karen holds our supporters in. That's what it's revealing. And when when you, you were saying a, a, a minute or two ago that, you know, how do you, how do you change if the person who's in charge of change doesn't want to change? Well, there's a saying that's used a lot in the commercial world. If you can't change the people, change the people. And that brings us neatly back to GSB out because, you know, the supporters are moving on. And if the club don't want to engage, then those shareholders, they need to move on. Just go. And to me, it is that simple. So Karen can shove her head in a bucket and ignore it as much as she likes. But there's one of her and there's 50,000 of us and it's that simple. Yeah, and I, I think one of, the, one of the important differences as well, I mean, Sean, you mentioned the SAB there and those of us who were present during those those early meetings, which were, of course, pre the move to Stratford, can recall um, entering one particular meeting, for example, and being told to leave our mobile phones at the door uh, before signing um, NDA. An, an NDA. Yeah, exactly, as well. And it, it was quite ludicrous. But I, I think the difference between that, the OSB, and what we're seeing now and the construct that Steve and Andy and, and the, the Hammers United team are leading there wasn't eight and a half thousand Hammers fans uh, marching in the lead up to, to those particular organisations. And, and I, I think, you know, now Hammers United have a mandate from the supporters. They, they've been given that. They, they've proved that they've got the support. It's one thing saying that, you know, as, as some people have done previously, that we've got 15,000 members um, of, a, of a Facebook group. It's a totally different thing putting eight, nine thousand people on a march, a very visible march. And you know, walking to the stadium uh, under one banner. So, um, you know, I, I think from that point of view, it's 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 likely to be slightly different. But um, anyway, enlightening stuff. And uh, I, I think we'd all. Uh, does anyone want before we wrap up? Does anyone want to add anything yeah. to that? Particular can I just case, clarify Steve? a couple. Of, can I clarify a couple of things? The club have got nothing to do with it, in the sense that they're being asked to recognise it. Well, not recognise it, but to talk to it. If they don't want to talk to it, it will still exist, hopefully. It will still form. And the club are going to look pretty damn stupid because I think the the um, prospectus will be published. All of the terms will be open. People will be able to look at it and think, well, that's just a reasonable request. That, you know, And it's not just HU. You know, Pride of Irons, Bayham, Supporters Club, Bondholders. There'll be an away supporters representative. Mm -hmm. there, there should be an elected chair that all the supporters can vote for. You know, it's going to be a it's going to be quite a high profile thing. And if the club don't want to get in bed with it, then that look out, quite frankly. I think the momentum is there to have it. Okay. Thank you, uh, Steve, for the clarification there. Uh, anyone else before we move on? Any, uh, uh, yeah, George, off, off you go. Maybe I'm being stupid, but if you look at Arsenal when they were owned by two or three different people, didn't they used to have an AGM where they'd speak to the shareholders and then announce things? Is that possible to do that with us? That's, Steve, do you want to take that point up? Oh, it's for the club to do what we want to do in, in terms of, you know, there are those regulations on them. They, they satisfied it in their own terms by forming the OSB to, to justify their, their, their talking, their liaison with supporters. 
I think everybody now accepts, including themselves, that that was insufficient. So, yeah, you know, we're hoping to have regular meetings with them with issues tabled by the different groups in a, in a proper moderated fashion. And as, as Eamon said earlier, it's not as though we're asking for, for the world. We're asking for what should be happening and should have been happening to everybody's benefit 10 years ago. OK, great stuff. Just on that, George, at the very first SAB meeting back in 2011 or whatever it was, an inquiry was made about a supporters trust and, and the response came back from the club very clearly and unequivocally that the SAB was not a supporters trust and was never going to be a supporters trust. I'd like to think in the decade that's, that, that's followed, our club has learnt its lesson and that actually a proper recognised group of supporters have to be engaged with uh, in an appropriate way. Um, but it kind of told me back then, a decade ago, that there was an inherent distrust of engaging with supporters. I hope they've learned the lesson and the thing that's been put together sounds very promising. Um, but that just illustrates how steep the hill is in terms of a dialogue with this particular set of owners. Thank you. Thank you, Eamon. Thank you, everybody. Um, well, it's been a most enlightening debate. Um, we've uh, spoken an awful lot. It's well, just done over two hours, so it's not too bad. We, we've been looking at about 90 minutes, so we haven't run over too far. I hope I haven't kept uh, any of you from your beds tonight. But um, before we do wrap up, I'd like to just go to... Uh, this is, after all, uh, a Hammers United uh, sponsored debate. So I would like to go to our Hammers United representatives just to... Uh, wrap up tonight. Um, if you could tell us, guys, uh, Andy and, and Steve, I guess primarily, um, what uh, what what have you what have you got in the pipeline for for Hammers United in the coming weeks? Yeah, I'm sure a lot of it is confidential. You can't actually reveal, but uh, is there you know is there anything you can give to your um, your members right now? And in, in terms of uh, you know where you go from here, uh, Steve, let, let's uh, let's start with you. I think. Well, I'm, I'm largely concentrating on this um, proposal. Um, okay. and hope that that goes live well it will go live one way or another in the next couple of weeks so I've got my eye on that but you know we're a dual pronged sort of like organisation we've, we've been trying to do that on a, on a constructive basis uh, and there is a campaign to get GSB out and uh, I know that that's going to carry on as well there's been quite a lot of imaginative ideas obviously COVID, COVID friendly ideas and, and they'll be ramped up the more they don't talk Okay, thank you Steve uh, Andy, uh, anything uh, you can add to that? Not really, no. I mean, um, there's a lot of stuff that's kicking around. There will be some stuff that's going to be coming up. Just all of a sudden, watch this space. Yeah. And uh, what's, you know, I mean, how difficult has it been for you? It's, I mean, there was obviously that, that you know, highly high profile march in when was it the the end of february i think wasn't it yeah it's been very difficult for you guys how how tough has it been to sort of keep the momentum going in recent months given you know the restrictions placed upon you and and well, well obviously the COVID, the, the covid thing just in terms of what we were looking to do really came to us at a bad time probably came as a you know a, 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 that's a good time for gold sullivan and brady very to kill so. momentum um I would expect that were we able to do a, a, another march or stroll, as it were, we'd probably get fifteen or 20,000 out quite easily. I'm, I'm, I'm really confident of that. But we have to work within the law, and that seems to be changing on a daily basis. So we will continue to do that. But we have got some things coming up. Uh, we've been kicking around loads of ideas. Um, and as I say, I'm, I'm not going to reveal anything um, for obvious reasons, but watch this space. We've not gone away. Okay, there you go. Uh, good stuff. Um, and more power to your collective elbow, I think, going forward. You've certainly done um, some fantastic work uh, so far and for the, for the supporters, and we look forward to seeing what you, uh, what you guys come up with. Uh, in terms of uh, what we're going to be coming up with in the next week or two, there's going to be a couple more of these debates coming up. Um, Chris from Hammers Chat. Uh, I believe is going to be hosting the next one. I might even be back next week to do another one with some more um, prominent members of the West Ham fan community. Um, but, for, but for now, it's uh, that's about it for tonight. I think we're going to wrap up there. So my, I'd just like to thank everybody 
who's joined me on the panel tonight. That's Eamon from KUMB, Jim from the H List, Steve and Andy from Hammers United, Sean from Claret and Hugh, and George, uh, the Hammers United member, um, for, for joining me tonight. And uh, I hope you've managed to take something from tonight's debate. If you want to uh, comment on what you've heard, if you've got any suggestions or thoughts on what you've heard tonight, um, go to the Hammers United Facebook group. You can always join us at uh, the KUMB.com forum or there's uh, various other forums and groups. I'm sure you will post uh, at and are members of where you can leave your comments and thoughts. But uh, uh, Hammers United's website, of course, is the first port of call if you need any more information about the group. Um, thank you to everyone, as I say, for joining me tonight. Thank you to everyone who's tuned into this and uh, we will all see you very soon. And it just leads me to say... Come on, your irons. <laughs>